We're getting new at this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Great start to the show, everybody. Oh, uh, man. Mean, hey, at least the people that are watching on 12 Ounce Sports, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or Zingo TV, sign up for Zingo TV today. Using the promo code 12 ounce, that's the number 12, lowercase OZ, channel 761. Now, let me get back to what, how we regularly do this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome back to another episode of the Keel Podcast. Jokes on you, it's the Keel Show. I'm your host, Alex Keel, alongside me, the insider of the insiders. <laughs> Pause for effect. Keep going. Wait a little longer. Tyler Keel. That's my name. I'm the one that got this going. I am the reason why this show is, uh, well, starting off strong. Good start, boys. Well, okay. For the record, I had to turn off the, I mean, I, I had to make sure the mics were off because we were talking. And, and the last thing you and I need, Alex, is for people to, uh, to, to hear us talking and stuff. That is true. We want to make sure that we only put the best quality content out there for you. Sure. Because the pre-show stuff that it was recording beforehand is just going to be awful. Today's episode is brought to you by Second String Leather Company. They've got everything from branded gear like Tyler is wearing his good old t-shirt there. I've got a sticker right on my water bottle all the way to their Elite Collection. The Elite Collection is a special curated group of hand-selected pieces that their staff has personally picked out that feature unique branding, labels, and names that simply stand out from the rest. In today's modern era, you can't go wrong with a good quality product at a fair price. Second string leather company, crafted from the crease. Crafted from the crease. Thank you, Joe Messina, for the shirt. Today's episode is also brought to you by MyBookie.com. Folks, sports are getting back into the mainstream, and that means more sporting events to bet on. MyBookie.com allows you to bet on all sports that allow you to bet on them. Win and get paid. Use the promo code 12 ounce sports. That's promo code 12 ounce sports and join free today. Today, which is July the 6th. I'm just making sure everything's all set after our uh, inauspicious start to the show. Well, because we got a lot to talk about here today. We do, but if you want to talk about some stuff and let us know that we had a great start. On today's show, make Which sure to use lie. <laughs> hashtag TKS at the Keel Show. Just get involved in the conversation, get involved in the show. And tell Tyler when to turn the mics on. Yes. That'd be great. <laughs> Someone should text me and say, Tyler, turn the mics on, except for you, Alex. Just being like, hey, you should turn the mics on. Yeah. And if you want have any questions, make sure to hit us up in the chat or on the comments during today's episode. We will try to get to all of them and answer them as best as we possibly can. The question of the day. For today, for using the hashtag AskTKP, by the way. AskTKP. We'll have to switch that to Ask TKS. TKS. Ask TKS. Oh my gosh, this is a great start to the show. I only had one cup of coffee today, guys. I'm it's just only like we've done the Keel podcast for so long. For like only two years and just trying to change everything. See, I yeah. told you, Alex, what did I tell you before the show? I'm a lot more calm this week. It means the show is going to go better. Possibly. What? And guess what? Hasn't gone well at all. It's fine. Fine. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, so the question of the day, courtesy of World Hockey Report, which airs Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Mountain Time on 12 Ounce Sports. Shout out, Cody Jansen. The question is, what is the worst junior rank ever? All right. So this is a very odd question because, first of all, I'm just going to eliminate Tier 3 teams right off the hop. Anything Tier 3 because – or Tier 3 or – most junior B and junior C ranks in Canada because tier three in the United States and junior BC are also are mainly public ranks. That said, Alex, your answer, we were talking about it before the show today and we, and you immediately said, well, that it, it should be Flint. It the, should the Dork well, financial credit union center in Flint. Well, here's the thing. I can only speak on rinks or facilities that I have personally been to. I'm not going to make any judgment on somewhere that I haven't been or have only heard rumors about. The reason why I say Flint is because after, what is it, about three years now, they still do not have clean water there. Therefore, it is not the best rink to be at. So Alex is judging based on the city, in which I'll be honest, Flint is not the best ever. So that's why I stuck with the idea. Well, not even just the fact that it's not the best ever. It's just they don't have clean water. Yeah, You're, so. You have a better chance of drinking Coke there and having a healthy lifestyle than drinking the tap water. True. Period. 
That's why I I wonder. If, no disrespect to Flint, you guys are screwed out of this, but I'm just saying. So I wonder now, though, if the well, what what's the what's the worst? I'm trying to think because I mean, I've been to Muskegon multiple times. I was there when the Lumberjacks of the USHL first came in after the the IHL UHL thing they tried out for a couple of years, the reinvention of the IHL. And it wasn't the best arena. It was five. It was 5,500 seating capacity that sat maybe 1,100. Now they've cut it down. It's a lot nicer. Alex, you've been there with me before. It's a very yes. beautiful arena now. So I'm not. I'm, that one is out. Now the one that I am. Gosh, I don't say I'm one I'm against. I'm not a fan. Well, I can't say Port Huron anymore because Port Huron is no longer. It's a Fed team now. Because Port Huron had a really bad one. Traverse City, despite being an NA, a public rink, a North American league. It was a nice rink. I mean, they set it up very nice. Of course, when you have the Red Wings training camp there every year, you got to make sure it looks pretty. And obviously they had the prospect tournament, except for this coming fall, which is a shame because I think we were going to try to go up there for that. At least I was going to try to get up there and do some live stuff with all the great prospects that were going to be there. But off the top of my head, gosh, I'm trying to think about the central. See, should I do current or should I do recent? Or like ones that were last used by a junior team, because I could say Let's, the Central Illinois Flying Aces in Bloomington. Not a big fan. Have of Have you one. been there? Yes. Okay. In that case, I'll allow it. Uh, I've never been to Danbury, home of the what's going to be the North North American League team, and I've heard Danbury is an okay rink. Danbury, home of the hat tricks. Home of the hat tricks, and now they're going to have the junior hat tricks this coming season in the North American League. North I thought American they were Hockey in the SP. No, the F- Danbury Hat Tricks, the oh, that pro was team, the, the, the that's the Fed team. Fed. They're going to have that's the right. junior Hat Tricks who are going to be in North American Hockey League team. Mm, and I think they're still going to house a Tier 3 team as well. Oh, man, that's a toughie, though. Oh, uh, Toledo's, to- Toledo's Tier 3. I can't Do you want to just go to the, with the one in uh I don't want to say Flint. I'm not going to say Flint. I'm going to go with, yeah, where the Central Illinois and Pliny, so It's just, it's old. And I, for some reason, I don't mind the rink that much. I mean, the, the facilities in Flint aren't that bad. It still reminds me of old. That's why if whenever, if Kalamazoo ever had a team at old Wing Stadium, Wings Event Center now, excuse me, I wouldn't mind it. It's old time hockey. That's why I like those kind of rinks. That's why I still consider Flint the arena, Alex, the rink, the arena. Okay. The place around it. When I have to go into Piranis, I have to make sure my car windows are up and lock my door, but. So I'm going to go with Fine Ranzo, Central Illinois Flying Aces, formerly of the Central Flying Aces in Bloomington. I forget what the rink's called. It's over there in Illinois. That's all I know. I forget what the rink's called. That's how Illinois. I'm Illinois. What did I say? You said Illinois. I meant like Central. Directions, folks. I wasn't pointing for a specific direction. I'm sorry. It's fine. The people that are listening to the show are like, I don't know what you're talking about, so it's fine. Just get on to what you're talking about today. Oh, that's you're good right, point. fans. Let's do that. Now, what we are going to be talking about today, we're going to be talking about the return to play, both the hub cities that were selected, Phase 3 and Phase 4 protocols for the National Hockey League. We are also going to be talking to Luke DeCock from the Rowley News and Observer, who will join us around probably 6.30 to talk about the Canes. I'm going to have a good time doing that. Oh, yeah. We are also going to be talking to Nashville play-by-play voice Pete Weber, who will uh, come on early in the second hour of today's show to preview the Preds series against Arizona, the Zona Yotes. The Zona Yotes. Of course, we talked to Louis Pinoan on the Cule podcast back a few months ago about it, and he's always a good guy to talk to, so it's good to get both sides of the series. Alex, both sides of the story. That is true. The CBA talks is another thing that we will talk about and how they could help NHLers go back to possibly the Liam, the Olympics. The, Olympi- have, the Olympics, Alex? The Olympics, and we also have some possible breaking news on that that we will get into later and you know whatever we have else we have time for if we have time and we got a lot to talk about today of course the two interviews and such not three interviews this week because i made sure i'm like okay we don't need everybody on the show at once right it was probably good for the premiere just to you know get things going you know get some big names in there hey talking to people and be like yeah no we had ken cal on the where you heard ken cal on the show yeah like, that was oh, no yeah everyone, and just everyone. like playing to like nonchalant like I told Thomas, and he's like, because Thomas has actually met Ken Cal. And I, I'm pretty sure Ken Cal remembers Thomas, maybe. I don't know. But I just remember, like, oh, he's like, really? I'm like, that's awesome. Way to go, man. And I'm like, you follow us on Facebook, Thomas. Don't you know this? Did you see my announcement, my he, graphics? He probably didn't. That's probably true. He's, hard, I mean, you also, you he's also a have hard to working man. You also have to think. People got lives outside of this stuff. 
I don't have a life. I sit here and do nothing all day. That's why if you do have a life and you have stuff that you got to do during the day, make sure if you can't watch us on lot on the live show, go to the Keel Show YouTube page to watch the replay as well as listening to us wherever you listen to your podcast to get the show and listen to it whenever you got the time. By the way, good old boy, uh, the rando calling you out there, Alex, telling you how you said the Danbury had an SPHL team. He said, big old oof for you. Oh, whatever. At least he wasn't listening when we forgot to turn on the mics. That's fine. <laughs> good start, boys. Good Great start. start. That's the show right after us, isn't it? Yes, it is. Talking nope. Miners with the Rando, coming up at 8.30 on 12 Ounce Sports. Now, yeah, just, let's I, get I, I, into... Did I really just do that? Yep. I, I just did... Oh, man. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> oh. I actually met Dave Coulier last year. Did I tell you about that? Who met cares? Him at- <laughs> that show sucked. <laughs> I'm wow, sorry. Wow. I'm sorry. Full House I, fans coming in here like, what do you mean Dave Cooley is the best? Full House sucked. Fuller House even worse. Well, yes, because any remake is awful. I'm just saying. I'm just telling you. I'm just saying. By the way, should we get to the breaking news here before we get too far behind the schedule here? Tonight? Yes, Tyler. We should get into the breaking news. Tyler, who tweeted what? Because you're the Mr. Twitter guy. Blah, 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 blah. The question is, Alex, who didn't tweet what? That's the question. Everyone tweeting because, according to Chris Johnson, Elliot Friedman, Bob McKenzie, Barry Brunt, I, I missed one. A lot of people. Good buddy Fridge, by the way. Oh, for pizza. Tweeting out that the NHL and the NHLPA have tentatively agreed, tentatively, Alex, agreed on a new CBA or CBA alter, alterations to extend it through the 25 2026 season. This is all tentative, and they're also tentative dates. For everything to start as well. Chris Johnson just tweeting just less than half an hour ago. This is why it's somewhat breaking news because it was right before we went live. The July 13th will be the start of training camp, which will be the beginning of phase three. And July 26th will be when the teams travel to the hub cities, being Toronto and Edmonton. We'll get to those here in just a minute. And August 1st, Alex. August the 1st. Which, if you look at your calendars, the calendars, ladies and gentlemen, 26 days will be the start of the qualifying round. You're supposed to add in the, the law and order effect there. Dun, dun. No, dun, dun. And then have like l- l- words like August 1st starts. Well, you're the graphics guy. I can't do this it. stuff live. Look, I barely have <laughs> this going. I, I Look, it's it's going still. Gosh, bless it. You got the 12 ounce down over here. You got the my bookie here. I'm, I'm just, oh, I mean, I there. Good God. I can't even point where it is on the screen. You're fine. I could never be a weatherman, by the way. But. They've tentatively agreed on the CBA, which, when Alex mentioned, because don't forget, I did most of the outline yesterday, before, well, before everyone went back to work on a Monday after a holiday weekend. By the way, belated happy Canada Day and happy 4th of July to both Canadian and American viewers and listeners. I I was in, interested, because I this literally just came out. I didn't hear about a vote or anything. The only thing I was hearing about voting was, what kind of altered a little bit later on, was supposed to be in the second half of the show tonight, was the fact that the NHL had a plan for what the CBA is going to entail, which was going to actually have players have the option to opt out by tomorrow of opt out of the playoffs. And they have to do it by then. Now, obviously that can be voted on and changed because Chris Johnson said that a few days ago. Now with their tentative agreement, which by the way, still needs to be voted on by both the players and the owner. So the league and the NHL player association, which I'm sure that they probably will vote in positive of. Well, if the, if the, excuse me, if the league, the them. league and the player association agreed to it, now it's the players and the owners need to have a unanimous decision in order for this to go forward. But there is a lot to get into with that. And one of them is the fact that now we have actually have a labor piece for the first time, Alex, in probably our lifetimes. At least for another six years. I had to look at the make sure it's, is it 2020? 2020 is taking a long time, Alex. Yeah. It's already been a nice couple of years this one year. Yeah. This half a year. I'm just saying I called this because I knew for a darn fact that they weren't going to go for another 10-year deal. Oh. Well, okay, don't forget. This is not a full brand new CBA. This is alteration to the current CBA, which they voted on to it's a CBA not... CBA extension. CBA extension that they did not want to reopen when they voted on before this past season, which was why we were like, oh my gosh, we're going to have you know, a lockout again. It's going to be great, blah, blah, blah. But now the fact that we're going to... I mean, the fact that we're going to have hockey for confirmed six years, we're not going to have to worry about another lockout until, well, until I'm, until I'm 30. Yeah. Oh, bully. 
30. Should I do the Joey Tribbiani thing? My God, why? Let the others grow old. No, 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 I can't do that. Not with you. Okay, no. not with you on the show. No. But I'm interested to Don't. see what the league's going to do from here because now this also includes the league agreeing to sending players back to the Olympics. That said, don't everyone go crazy. Oh, hold on. I can see you going crazy there through the camera. Why do you always got to point at the, at the camera? You always I, do that. Because I got to look at the people that are watching. Why, that way you can get the screenshot in. That way you can get the, oh, I'm pointing at you, brother. You better watch. Well, thank you, Alex. I know what my screen grab is going to be. But I, the thing is about this is the fact that now the league has to have a financial agreement with the the International Olympic Committee. It's not just the players. The NHL is like, all right, we can send you guys. Yeah, good there, luck with that. There needs to be a financial. Well, here's the thing. After the 2022 games, there was talks between the league and the IOC saying, all right, we'd be willing to kind of help out a little bit. Because they realized that the ratings were so far down for the men's games in the 2022 games. Or, uh, yes, 20. Yes. Oh, yeah. 20, yeah. No, 2018. Sorry, 2018 games. 2018 games. Because they're going to be playing in 2022. Yes. Get ahead of myself here. Yes. But that is very, that's a great thing to hear about because now that we're going to have the best on best tournaments that we all want to see. Well, now, obviously, teams can be different in a couple of years. But. Here's the thing, though. You also have to take into consideration, and you know what? The IOC is in the IIHF is going to be taking a lot of, oh, yes. I don't think the IIHF is going to be as much involved. I know what you're saying, but I don't think they're going to be as involved they're not, as they no, were in the past. They are not going to be as involved because the IOC re- is realizing that finally, hmm, you guys are being a little poop sticks about this. Because let's be honest, the conversation that's been had, it's between the NHL and the IIHF. IOC, no problem. Because they're the overseeing figure of all sports. They don't have time to deal with every single sport in the entire Olympics. Right. But when you think about, oh, yes, the TV ratings are going to be amazing now because the they have the NHL players back. Guess where the sport and the Olympics are still being held, guys? Beijing. Still in China. So it's going to be a lot of midnight games. A lot of early morning games. Well, remember so, how remember how the uh, Olympics worked when they were in 2008? We were still watching. I mean, yes, we watched throughout the night, but Michael Phelps was swimming in prime time. He was swimming at 9 o'clock at night, Eastern time, Alex, when we were watching. Yes. People were still was, just getting out of work over in the, on the Pacific seaboard and still being able to watch Michael Phelps. Because Cause it was a morning meet. And because the Olympics realizes where a lot of the viewers come. Because people will watch no matter what. I was getting... Could not tell you how late I stayed up to watch the Canada U.S. women's gold medal game in 2018. Extremely late. I I'm literally. Just, I'm just saying, it's not going to be as much of a jump as they probably think it's going to be. If they're going to be expecting, you know, Buko Bucks comparing it to when the Winter Olympics were in Vancouver, and you know every other time that it's been kind of relatively close to North America because that's a lot of where the viewer base is. For this, for these kind of sports, especially when the medal rounds do involve the United States and Canada, just saying, it's not going to be this huge jump that people are probably going to think it's going to be. It's going to be a lot more. Don't get me wrong, but it's not going to be this huge overseeing thing. I'm interested to see how this thing works. I hope that the CBA is agreed upon by the players and the owners. Uh, and honestly, I'm just ready for more hockey at at the end of this all. I know you are. And Frank Severa, Frank, excuse me, yeah, Frank Saravelli of TSN Senior Hockey Reporter is absolutely going to town. Already has an article about the CBA talking about how the playoff share. We'll get to that a little bit later on, but let's get to the Hub Cities first before we bring Luke DeCock on from the Raleigh News and Observer because obviously that's going to be a big thing here in just a few minutes. So let's get to the Hub Cities first, Alex. Yep, so the two Hub Cities that were selected for the Eastern Conference, they will be playing in the Hub City of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Which is... is that way. That's east, right? Have we distinguished the cardinal directions? That's north. So east, east is that way. You pointed the west, though. For, okay. That way, behind this wall, if you go about six hours that way. Sure. Give or take how long it takes at the bridge, even though it's closed right now, is Toronto. That way. Okay. Anyways. So that is for the Eastern Conference. Western Conference will be playing in the provincial capital of Alberta. You know, you're in oiler country and feeling good. They're playing in Edmonton. Oh, I, 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 I don't care if that's been 14 years. I still love that intro. 
It is a pretty good intro. Back so. when the Black Eyed Peas were so popular, that the Oilers decided to use them for their for their entrance music. I mean, seriously, who has the gall to do that? The Oilers, that too, the and they Oilers because they the dang lyrics near, said "pump it, pump it louder," and they dang near did it. And they had "Saving Me" by Nickelback, which is still an awesome song. I don't care what anyone says, Alex. But who won? You were not even alive. You were barely alive to even know the difference. It was 2006. You didn't know any better. I was eight. And you didn't even know. Yes, I did. Because I, 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 I looked at Chris Pronger and I'm like, you're real tall. <laughs> He's big. You're a big boy. Uh, so. You see, Mark was a star. Tyler, on the script, you asked, you put on the question, it, why is Toronto the best decision? Why is Edmonton the best fit for the West? And I'll tell you why. Wait, I thought, wait, are you asking me or am I asking you? I'm not asking anybody. I'm answering the question you put there. So we'll both give our reasons. Why is selecting Toronto and Edmonton the best case scenario for the return to play? Purely on the fact that with the Canadian rule of having to be quarantined for two weeks before getting back into com- competition, once entering the country, having both cities be Canadian cities proves just that much easier. Simple as that. Is that for both? Or is yeah. that Okay. Yeah. You want my reason? Wh- why? The Hockey Hall of Fame. No, that's not the reason why. Because they know that they're going to open the borders up and be able to go down there and actually visit Toronto, which would be nice. Actually, no, that won't happen either because for some reason, I just feel like the borders are going to stay closed until Halloween. Ty. What? It's not like you're going to be able to watch the game. Hey, Maple Leaf Square is going to be bumping. Uh, it better not be. It's going to be bumping socially distant. It's going to be six feet apart and be like, what be like, What a play that was. I know. That's what it's going to be like. I'd take my mic away just so I didn't hurt the people's ears watching or listening. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just making, hey, you're. I, I, I'm just saying, you're welcome, okay? I don't want to. You're you know, welcome. That Well. Here's the thing. You're welcome, Canada and America. Does it still count as Maple Leaf Square if Maple Leafs aren't playing? What happens if they hey, get eliminated it's, it's Maple Leaf first Square. off the bat? Alex, on, let's just say on August the 12th, what do they call that square outside Scotiabank Arena next to Real Sports and Sport Check and all that? What do they call it? Sidewalk. Maple Leaf Square. On October the 30th, when the Leafs play the Devils, it's called Maple Leaf Square. The only time it's not called Maple Leaf Square is because when the Raptors are playing. That's it. That's the only other time. In that case, it's Jurassic Park. And sure. unfortunately, the Blue Jays don't really have much of a sidewalk to watch the games on. I mean, they, actually, they kind of do. They don't really have games to begin with, Ty. They do. They start July 24th. I just got the notification from TSN. I, I, I was talking about how they're, they're just not good. And the Tigers are... I'm just saying, you got one player named Bo. That's it. <laughs> Bo Michette. And he doesn't play two sports. So, I hey, he's a heck of an esports guy, from what I've uh, seen. Everyone's a heck of an esports guy. We're sitting on our butts all day. Excuse me. Some are, but some are not the best at video games, Alex. If I played Call of Duty tournament, I'd get killed. I play NHL. Uh, we oh, it's lost. Because you suck. I would have won the if garbage. I didn't. Okay, I would have won that Grand Rapids Griffins esports tournament had I not taken pity no, on the guy who was have. blatantly stoned coming into the game. No, you, bro, you he, did not. You lost to him too. Don't even try. Because he was good. <laughs> he was up, straight up was good. I was up 3 nothing on him, so. There are people that have lives and play video games when they have free time, and people that just play video games. And he was one of those guys that just played video games. Okay. Back to Toronto. I like Toronto. It's 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 a big city. You got a lot around it. You're able to quarantine these players because the hotels, they've really been doing much with the hotels are in, in Toronto. They've been closed down. Nothing's really been opened up. Actually, it was one of the conversations I had with Joseph Zita earlier. Joseph Zita from Editor and Leaf. His interview will be on next week's show on June the 13th here on 12 on Sports, 6, 6, 6 o'clock. I... It's just, it's able, they're able to quarantine them off and there's a lot of rules. Like I said, we'll get to all that stuff later. Edmonton, it's big. It's a big city. It's a big but little city. Little but big city. It's a perfect town to put so many players into one area and keep them all there. No one has to leave because there's plenty to do, but they're also to make sure that they can keep everyone together and not make sure players, you know, kind of go out and about. 
But of course, Edmonton will be the home for not just the West, but also the Cup Final. That is true. The Stanley Cup Final will be decided in Edmonton. Now, for the American listeners and American viewers, they're probably wondering, why didn't they pick, you know, at least one American city? Well, remember how we talked about how Vegas was going to be the city, but it's... It was the front runner. It was the front runner for the longest time, but something must have came around, and that's why every, this whole situation is fluid. That's why right now it's most likely that Toronto and Edmonton, the league has not confirmed it yet, but it's most likely that it'll be in Toronto and Edmonton. Here's my theory, and I, don't, I haven't really looked at all the reports that are coming out of Canada, but as of right now, the United States, are, it's, it's going through its second wave yep. where it's getting this huge spike of cases. And when I was thinking about this and I was looking, about this, looking at this you know, over the course of this past week, I knew for a fact that if one of the hub cities was in the United States or Canada, the other one would have to be too because they would not let them cross the border True. as freely. So, and also too, and it just sounded like the you, way the you don't want spikes to, you know, because the the Stanley Cups being held in Edmonton. If you played in, let's just say Detroit, if the East was settled in Detroit, then they would have to enter into Canada, and then then they would still have to wait two weeks from there. In comparison to, they play in Toronto, and they can go straight to Edmonton. That's it, and then you know do the like. Quar- they set up their quarantine in there. But that is enough for that. We'll talk about it later on. We'll talk about it later. But we got a lot to talk about that CBA and everything and phase three and phase four protocols. Why am I pointing at the camera like that? Mike? I don't know, Ty. I did the and everything. Oh, gosh. You just need. I'm going to cut off your hands. Okay. You should do that. First, we're going to go to commercial and then we will talk to Luke DeCock. Talk about some gains here on the Keel Show. Esports are here to stay. Go to jazzsports.ag, log into your account, and look for our new esports section on the top of your screen. Browse through all the different available matches and watch them live with our exclusive esports betting platform. Get instant access to game results, pending and graded bet reports, outright bet types, and upcoming match schedules, all at the easy reach of your fingertips. Jazz Sports puts you in the game. Drink Aid, ready for distribution worldwide. Welcome back to the Keel Show on 12 Ounce Sports. 
Alex Key alongside Tyler Key here welcoming our guest of today's show. Our first guest, he writes about the Carolina Hurricanes, among other things, at the News and Observer in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Luke DeCock. Hey, how we doing, Luke? Hey, guys. Hey, how we doing? Uh, Luke, so I guess uh, thank you for because we talked a little bit a little bit last week. Uh, you're on vacation right now. I appreciate you taking the time out of your vacation to come out. How have you been handling this whole coronavirus deal right now? You know, I mean, professionally speaking, um, I, I'm busier than I've ever been. Um, part of that's because they've taken some people from the sports staff and pulled them over to, to news coverage, which is which is fine and, and makes sense. Um, but, you know, there's been so much to write about with, um, you know, how, how coronavirus and COVID are, are affecting sports. And in our market, you know, we've got the hurricanes. Um, we've also got uh, Duke and North Carolina and NC State. So pretty much anything that has an impact on professional or college sports is going to be on our radar screen. And because of that, um, you know, the, the, the whole sort of progress and process of coronavirus and the impact it's had on, on sports in general, um, you know, I, I should be I'd remiss if I didn't mention the uh, the North Carolina Courage, who are the, the best women's pro team, pro soccer team in the world. And they're the only league, you know, that U.S. league that's actually playing right now. So, um, you know, we've just it has just been a lot. And um, between sort of filling in the gaps in some places and trying to deal with this very complex issue and, and the kind of multifold ramifications it has for for sports at all levels. Um, it's, it's been amazingly busy. So, you know, for us, this started in the middle of the ACC tournament, ACC basketball tournament, which is one of our, our big events of the year. And, and typically I'm on the road from the start of the ACC tournament till whenever the hurricanes are eliminated from the playoffs. So last year, that was basically from the first weekend in March until, you know, Memorial day. And this time around, uh, I left Greensboro on a, on a Friday and I haven't really left the house since. So. Um, but despite that, without games to cover, there's just been so much uh, to write about and, and so many stories to tell that, um, you know, in my role, I've actually stayed really busy. Well, that's good. I mean, it, it does seem like there's a lot going on other than just live events. And it, it's it's unique for us because, of course, we just started doing the live show. So we're almost working twice as hard as we ever done, Alex. That is true. But I, I mean, you, you talk about it. You have so much to, I mean, really cover down Right, you know, just down in North Carolina with you know all the other sports teams, whether it be collegiate, professional, semi-pro. Um, but you know, with talking about the Hurricanes having a you know I would say another successful season, um, clinching a spot in the playoffs. But this team has looked a little bit different from last season, where you know getting all the way to the Eastern Conference Final to play Boston. Obviously, you have you know. Dougie Hamilton out for a, an extended portion of the year and also some other personal changes in your eyes. What has been the biggest difference from last season to this season, as far as the hurricanes goes? Well, I think the, the biggest difference is that the, you know, when, when things started last season, you know, there was a new coach, there was a lot of, a lot of changes. There was a, a new mentality in a lot of ways. Uh, it was a fresh start for, for the coach and, and the captain and a lot of the players. And so that team had a real sort of team ethos. Um, you know, it had a, a real a, a, a community spirit that, that you usually only get from playing together for a long time. But that team sort of had it because it was, um, you know, such a, 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 a sea change in the organization. Um, new GM, new owner, all of that. So that team kind of, you know, had a lot of emotion, played with a lot of emotion, um, was really hard to play against, had a real grinding style, um, you know, played at a really fast pace. Now, there, you know, there was, as you mentioned, some personnel changes over the summer, and that's also a really hard intensity to maintain, uh, you know, especially when you go as deep in the playoffs as, as that team did. So, you know, this year they didn't have as much of that sort of spirit. Um, there was more of it was kind of being concocted on the fly. And in some ways, you know, certain elements of the team were better. You know, Dougie Hamilton got off to a really bad start last year and then kind of came on at the end before dipping again in the playoffs. And, and this year, you know, until he got hurt, he was playing really well. So there were, you know, some changes not having Justin Williams there. That had a big impact, you know, because he he's such a, a, a strong leader, such a veteran presence. 
And also, you know, he and Rod Brindamore really kind of share a brain. So he was really the coach's voice in the locker room in a lot of ways. And they didn't have that until January or whenever it was, February, I think it was January, that, that Williams unretired or partially unretired or however you want to say it. So, so there was that missing too. And it took this team a long time to figure out its personality and its mentality and its style. And then after it did, you know, there were little ups and downs. Uh, you know, when Justin Williams came back, it took a little while to figure out how to play with him. Then Hamilton gets hurt, and you, it takes a little while to figure out how to play without him. Um, if Brett Pesci gets hurt, which is a, a loss that probably people don't normally realize just how, how big a loss that is, what a big role Pesci plays on the defense. So, you know, there were kind of these ups and downs. And, and also, you know, people forget this. Peter Morazic wasn't as good as he was last year. And James Reimer, while he's had his moments and was kind of rounding into form, um, you know, didn't have didn't bail the team out the way that Curtis McElhaney did last year. So there were a lot of, you know, little changes that had a big effect. But the reality is the team wasn't in that different of a position in the standings. Um, you know, the people look at where the team ended up in the playoffs and think, oh, you know, it was the second best team in the East. But it was not for the majority of the the 2018-19 season or uh, and and again, it took a while for for the team to hit its stride in 1920. But right about the time things shut down, you know, it looked like the Hurricanes had figured out how they were going to play without Hamilton and Pesci. Um, they'd gotten some decent goaltending, as I said, from Reimer at times, who was kind of hitting his stride. Uh, things were really starting to fall into place. And then, of course, the pandemic hits and, and everything falls apart. So, you know, on the good side, they'll get Hamilton back. He's been skating. Um, that'll be a, a big help. Um, but obviously, everyone's going to be starting from scratch if the NHL can even pull this off. Um, but but those were kind of the biggest differences from a year ago. It was a it was a personality thing. It was partly a personnel thing. Um, and there were some changes. You know, you lose Calvin DeHaan, who was a really good you know, more stay at home ish type defenseman. Um, and you replace him uh, with Jake Gardner, who really struggled for a lot of the year and is, and is, you know, obviously more of an offensive guy, but was, you know, sort of only, only playing on the third pairing because of the way the, the ice time and responsibilities worked out. And, and, you know, that was all, all he earned. I mean, I'm not saying that he was misused or anything. That was just the way it worked out. So um, a lot of changes, um, but really more than anything, it was that mentality. It was, it was from a team that was this breath of fresh air to having to go back and do it all over again. And that's, that's hard for anybody in, in any job. It is definitely harder for some to grasp expectations. And because especially, like I said, a team that wasn't really expected to do the, go to the playoffs and then make the run that they did, they did come into this year with some more expectations. So maybe that's why they're maybe a hair more scrutinized than they were last season. But one guy that obviously got a lot of expectations ever really since his rookie season, but a guy that was offer sheeted by Montreal that the Canes were able to match, that's Sebastian Ajo. The good Sebastian Ajo, by the way, not the one that plays for the Islander system. He has, I mean, how do you think he's played this year? I mean, it's not hard. It's very difficult sometimes for some young players to really kind of go up towards superstar without getting, you know, kind of crumbling in the spotlight. How do you think Ajo has been this year with the Canes? Well, he's, he's, he, I think he's been fine. Oh, because he's so skilled and because he's, he's a gritty player for a skilled guy and because he cares very deeply and has that personality, you always look at him expecting more. And I think that'll be true for the, you know, the entirety of his career. He's just, he has so much to offer. Um, you always want more from him. Uh, but I think what he did this year was was fine. And especially not just the spotlight, but, you know, getting caught up in the contract drama last summer um, and then having this this massive new contract after the offer sheet. You know, that's a ton of pressure and not pressure that a different kind of pressure than he's faced at this point in his career. He's used to at this point. To, to being the primary offensive focus for the Hurricanes. That's been true for a couple of years. And it's been true as he's been forced kind of by necessity to move from the wing to center and, and hold down what is essentially the number one center spot on the team, which, you know, even in their wildest projections, he was seen more as sort of a first line, um, you know, finish, skiddy, grilled, uh, uh, gritty, skilled winger. And they basically had to turn him into a, into a two-way center. And, and he's, you know, done well in that role. So I think you always have to look at his offensive production as colored by the fact that he actually ended up with more defensive responsibilities than anyone ever kind of forecast, um, at least for this point in his career. I mean, I think there was always a thought that he could be a, 
you know, a, a legit number one NHL center in the long run. Uh, but his whole sort of career process has been uh, accelerated by the circumstances here. So I think he's done a really good job handling the pressure of his contract. You know, I think for him, a bigger issue was actually last year in the playoffs where he was banged up, couldn't really say anything about it, um, and was caught in that position between, you know, sort of playing hurt and not being able to impact the game, but also being the kind of player who's expected to still impact the game while playing hurt and was very much caught in that sort of catch-22. Uh, you know, I think that was probably harder for him than managing expectations this season, even with the big contract. Yeah, I mean just talking about you know what kind of production that Sebastian has been able to bring to the team and kind of how he affects the locker room. He definitely has become a big force for the Canes, but you did talk about, uh, and you did mention for quite a bit there, talking about goaltending and how that's affected the Hurricanes this season, you know, talking about, you know, Peter Mrazek not doing the best this possible, you know, this past season, James Reimer, you know, going on and off with um, all sorts of like, injury problems i know just you know in february he was diagnosed with a lower body injury yeah. so reimer's always had groin problems that's his problem yes yeah. so looking at the goaltending as you know a key part of a success of an nhl team especially when you're going deep into the playoffs you look at james reimer peter mraz again you know, you know people don't really talk about anton forsberg as well who do you think have been you know, who would you say has been the key player, you know, for the success of the season? Or would you say what has been the best tandem for the Hurricanes to lead them to getting to this point? You know, they really had to rely both on Morazic and Reimer. And, and Morazic, you know, hasn't been as good as he was at times last year. Um, he's had his moments, obviously. Um, but, but they need him to be the player he was in the first round against the Capitals last year. Um, you know, he, he really was a, a, an impact player in that series. Then he gets hurt against the Islanders and then comes back and plays really quite poorly against the Bruins in the conference finals. They're, the Hurricanes are a better team when Morazic is in goal and playing well. You know, Reimer's ceiling um, isn't as high as Morazic's is, at least in what we've seen here. But what the way Mara the Reimer was playing at the end uh, was, was totally, uh, you know, acceptable. It was good. Um, you know, he gave them a chance to win. And this is a team that can score goals. So if you can get out of that rut of giving up easy goals, this is a team that tends to thrive. And, and if you look at the history of the team over the last couple of years, you know, when they've had bad goaltending, when it's been Scott Darling, when it was a late career Cam Ward, everything else just kind of tends to fall apart. And when they had Reimer last year, when Darling flamed out again and Curtis McElhinney came in at the last day of training camp, and played terrific throughout the year, you know, they had the confidence in their goalies, not only that they would win them games, but they wouldn't lose them games. And I got to tell you, for the in, the in the last 10 years of the Hurricanes franchise, that's a huge change. Um, that's just not something that people have been able to say here. So, um, you know, there isn't really an answer to that, to any of that. Um, you know, and they, you didn't mention the, the fourth goalie in the system, um, Alex Nedeljkovic, a second round pick, who's played well given his chances. Um, and has played very well in the AHL and probably deserves a shot at the NHL and arguably was the best goalie in training camp. But, you know, because of the way the numbers worked out, didn't really get that chance. So, um, you know, the long term future of goaltending in this organization might be Forsberg and Adelkovic. Um, You know, for now, the, the Hurricanes are going to be their best when Peter Morazic is playing his best. Um, that's the highest ceiling they have in that they just need him to get there. Yeah, I remember Nettie when he played in Flint. We were talking about Flint Firebirds uh, off the top of the show, and I remember when he finished his junior career there before making the jump to the professional ranks. But going back to the Canes here, a big playoff series coming up here, a playing round, best of five against the New York Rangers, staying in the Metro the Hurricanes are. And this is a matchup that despite Carolina having you know, the better record, I think they are the higher seed, it's the Rangers who have the edge on them in the regular season. The Canes are 0-4 against the Rangers. The Rangers have played really good hockey against them, and the Rangers have really surprised a lot of people this year. What's going to be important for Carolina this season, or in this playoff series, excuse me, against the Rangers to break that schneid in order to move on? Well, a couple of things, and it's not just this year. The Hurricanes' record against the Rangers goes back several years, and it's abysmal. And a big part of that is Lundqvist. Um, so I think the key for the Hurricanes is the Rangers deciding to go with one of their two younger goalies with better stats and put Hank out to pasture. Um, because Lundqvist, no matter how old he is or how he's played against anyone else 
um, or how he's looked in a given month or week uh, inevitably looks like prime of his career, Henrik Lundqvist against the Hurricanes. It's just one of those weird things where a team and a goalie have that sort of mental symbiosis. I mean, there was a period of time where the Hurricanes could not beat Patrick Laleen. Uh, you know, these weird things tend to happen uh, sometimes. So th- there's there's nothing weird about it with Lundqvist, obviously. Um, that's just uh, they've played well against the Rangers in a couple games uh, and, and just, you know, outshot the Rangers, outchanced the Rangers and just not been able to get anything against Lundqvist. And the Rangers have been smart enough, I think, off the top of my head without looking it up. I think Lundqvist played in at least two and maybe three of the wins this year. I know he played in at least one in Raleigh where the Hurricanes just drastically outplayed the Rangers and Lundqvist just kind of looked like, you know, he was having a flashback. So that's a, that's going to be a big issue. You know, the, the thing the Rangers have is they've got a, a pretty young, pretty mobile defense. Um, that That's going to help you against Carolina because of the style that they play. And, and that's an issue that the, the Hurricanes have had with the Rangers too. But, you know, the Hurricanes will always be fine if they can get their big guys going, you know, if they can get the Ajo line going, if Jordan Stahl can get some points, especially on the power play, you know, he's not going to be a big power play scorer, but if he's scoring on the power play, it usually means things are going well because he's going to be in front of the net. He's going to be creating traffic. And if he can start kicking a few in, then everything else, it means everything else has fallen into place. So, and then goaltending obviously for the hurricanes is a big deal. Uh, but getting Dougie Hamilton back, which they wouldn't have gotten in the first round uh, uh, under normal circumstances, it's going to be a huge help. Um, it's just kind of ironic that the Hurricanes, after 10 years out of the playoffs, get into the playoffs last year, were playing their way into the playoffs this year, and they end up in an NHL system where they have to play the team that they play the worst against just to make it to the first round of the playoffs. All those years they finished 12th, they just sat at home the whole time. Now they got to play a 12th place team just to get into the playoffs. So it's, uh, you know, there's an old joke around here that the NHL will do whatever it can to make things hard on the Hurricanes. And this appears to be another one of those times. As, as uh, some Leaf fans up here, it's kind of the same way we believe. I guess like every team thinks that the NHL is against them. But I, I got to ask you before, last question before I let you go here, Luke, if you are Rod Brindamore, and obviously Peter Morazic is the foreseeable starter into this series in the Rangers, how tight of a leash does Brindamore have on Peter Morazic going against the Rangers? Will he be quick to maybe pull him to get Reimer in there? Or do you think he's going to stick with Morazic and go throughout the series? No, I, you know, they, they, they've had a history of, of, of switching up as they, as they, they feel needed. Um, there's no question about that. You know, Brenda Moore is not a pull a goalie in the middle of the game guy. I mean, I think he's only pulled, pulled the goalie maybe once in two seasons as a head coach. So, you know, when he starts a guy, he tends to stick with him. Um, you know, I, I, my, my guess is that will have a lot to do with how they look um, when they get back on the ice. I mean, I think if one of them is clearly ahead of the other, then that one will get a longer leash um, if they're roughly equivalent. You know, this is a team and a, and a coach in Brendan Moore's case over the last two years that hasn't hesitated to rotate goalies, um, you know, to alternate games, um, even in the playoffs. You know, there was a big decision in, in game one, I believe, of the Boston series uh, about whether, you know, to go back with Morazic, who is healthy again, or, you know, give 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 the, the start to Curtis McElhaney, who who played really well unexpectedly against against the Islanders in that sweep. So um, there's always a, a back and forth. But my guess is that'll have a lot to do with who looks good once they get back on the ice and a lot less to do with with reputations or the way they were playing in March when things got shut down. Right. See, hearing all this talk about Canes just warms my heart because Tyler, he may be a Maple Leafs fan, but me personally, I also root for the Canes. As, as well. you're wearing a shark sw- shirt, by the way. Hey, <laughs> I like hockey in general, so I doesn't matter where it is. If it's hockey, I like it. Alex but, is trying to hitchhike the nearest bandwagon. That's what he's trying to do right now. <laughs> I don't think San Jose is a good bandwagon. No, to maybe get not onto. right now. Maybe not right but now. But once again, we've been chatting with Luke DeCock. Uh, make sure to follow him on Twitter at Luke DeCock on Twitter. He is the once again the reporter uh, for the News and Observer down there in Raleigh. Luke, thank you so much again for taking the time out of your day to talk to us Yahoo's up here, and uh, I hope you uh, stay safe from the coronavirus. Yep, enjoyed it, guys. Take care. All right, talk to you later there, Luke. And Luke's a nice guy. I mean, it was funny because we were talking with him. Well, we were playing golf on Canada Day. And we were sitting there like, like, man, I'd like to get a guess. And I send a few feelers out there just to see who's interested, whatever. And there's a couple other names that I can't quite mention yet because finalized details haven't been worked out. But Luke was very kind enough to, you know, just simply be a part of the show because he was, I mean, he's such a nice guy. And 
And he's like, hey, how'd you get my email? Because I didn't give him his news and observer one. I gave him, I guess, his personal email. And I'm like, uh, LinkedIn? <laughs> You'd be surprised. I'll say this. Everyone jokes about LinkedIn, Alex. It is I a, don't. It's a wonderful tool. I mean, everyone's like, how'd you get Ken? Cal-? Well, Ken Cal got through Alex uh, Filipino, the media relations, public relations guy for the Detroit Red Wings. But like, how'd you get, uh, you know, how'd you ever get a chance to talk to Joe Bowen? How did you get um, Jack Michaels from the Edmonton Oilers? And I'm like, LinkedIn. You just find people you want to hook up with. I could try to get, for goodness sake, Sid Sixero if I wanted to. I don't know if that'd be an interesting interview. I feel uh, like I feel like it should be him and I yelling at each other. Uh, you don't think yeah, it's going to end well? I don't think. No. Just, yeah. just no. You just don't think it'll end well for anybody? Here's the thing. I would rather listen to Rod Brindamore talk for three hours. Now, okay. Consecutively. You, okay, Alex. Very important question for you. Would you rather... Here, an interview between myself and Sid Sixero. I don't care who's interviewing who, but him and I just talking to each okay, other. So for, what's the other option? For 30 minutes or 10 minutes of Rod Brindamore, Brindamore working out. Oh, 10. Dude, I'd go an hour of Rod Brindamore <laughs> working out. Are you kidding me? That guy's a, that guy. He's a monster. He's a beast. He could still play. 100% could still play. Oh, no, he can't play. Uh, uh, no, that no, that's like saying Chris Chelios could still play. He's in shape. Don't get me wrong. Hey, have you seen Sergey Berezin? Sergey Berezin, former Leafs center, by the way, looks like a. He was doing like plyometrics, like conditioning training on the beach, and he still looked more in shape than I am. He's like twenty years older than I am. Buddy, listen. Pavo Bure, Serge, Sergey Fedorov, all those guys—they still play freaking Sunday morning hockey all there in Russia. They still do that. They can still play. It's just a matter of. They, they can't play in the NHL. It's a completely different game. Remember when Hashik wanted to come back at 47? <laughs> I'm playing well in the Czech 3 League, guys. I can come back, 47-year-old Hashik, and I'm just like, good. Hey, I'm just saying, I don't think he's – he's not the oldest goaltender when the Stanley Cup, I don't think. I'm trying to think of how old Johnny Bauer was when he won his last Cup at the Leafs, 44, 45? You're asking the wrong person. Because Hashik won it, and he was 42 with Detroit in 08, if I'm not mistaken. I got We seriously got to do that trivia matchup between Thomas and Harrison. I'm just saying. Uh, hey, I'd be there to. I would moderate it. Where are the moderators? I, I would come up with all the questions. Because here's uh, the thing. No, because here's the thing. You would pick up some real obscure. Questions. No, I would make the rule from 1995 onward. That would be the only thing I would do because Thomas has nah. Thomas has admitted to me that the 93 playoffs were his first real recollection of diving into the Red Wings. 93 or 94. So, and Harrison so, is just about my age. He's a little older than I am. So you would not include any of the early... I games. would not include who scored the goal, who scored, who's Pete Babando, you know, Normie Smith. Who did he shut out in six overtimes in the 36 playoffs? I wouldn't do that. You Montreal would, Maroons, by the way. You wouldn't put up the one of the... You know who scored the goal in that game, Alex? No, I don't because Mud, I don't care. Mud Brunato. Mud Brunito. Great. The thirties were a wonderful time, Alex. All I'm saying you know, you is would have been named. You, you, you would have been put... named. You'd have been had a very funky name if you had been born in the thirties. Yeah. I can't think of what it would be though. I'm trying to think of a weird name that starts with A. Other than a- I feel like anything with A back in those days was Alan. What about Alfred? Alfie. Oh gosh, you'd been Alfie. I'd have been okay with that. Alfie Cool. Oh, um, at, that, at that point, it'd be Alfie Cool because. Um, we hadn't gotten there yet. <laughs> we hadn't gotten to the uh, World War II. Any hoot, but yeah, no. The, but yeah, no. Most Midwestern or anything. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but. but so, dude. Yes or no? no yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Do we need to get Charlie Barron's on the show? Uh, Talk or about the, the man at Walk Minute. Or at You Betcha Guy. You Betcha Guy? Yeah. The, Is he the guy that does the videos with him? No. No, he does the You Betcha videos. Maybe that's They're not him. Who's the guy guys. that's? I see the Midwestern dad ones. It's either Charlie or it's the other guy. It's, he looks he looks um, like Squirrely Dan, but he's, he's from Wisconsin. That's yeah, that's that's, that's that's the you betcha guy. Okay, yeah, we'll have both of them on. It won't be about hockey. Hey. I'll just say the Kula show. This one's and the title will be this one's not about hockey. Well, here's the thing, and I'll tell you about it. If we that's if Alex's we, thing. If we talk about so here's it, the thing. here's the thing, and I'll tell you about it. <laughs> that's not Midwestern. That's just Alex. Also phenomenal. Phenomenal is also my thing. Phenomenal if we is. Had, if we yeah, had those two, if we had those two on the show, one thing we'd have to talk about cheese is Packers over Bears. 
Well, yep. we can't do that, Alex. We are a clean show. I don't have a bleep button anymore. <laughs> We'd also have to talk about what beer is better. Bush. <laughs> I don't know. I is because this is the nectar of the. Dogs. Apparently, I've line and cool line kugels made up in Wisconsin. I would love to have that conversation. Like, I love to bring people regionally and have them discuss what beer they like and what beer we like based on the region. Because I'm not a big fan of Founders lighter ales or any of their lighter beers. I love the like the Dirty Bastard, but that's a stout. I love their dark beer, which you can't really drink in the summertime, Alex. It's just not. It's just not the right time. Of course, you can. Okay. Yes, Alex, you can le- think you can actually literally drink beer whenever you want. But why would you have a Guinness when it's 95 degrees outside? Because you drink You it have a Leinen Kugel, Orange Shirt, Summer Shandy, it tastes great. Because you drink it in the evening because it's a stout, so it's basically a dessert for your your, beer, My, for, your, your liver. Beer, for your beer buds. I was about to say, I'm like, dessert for your liver? And I'm like, nope, that's what you, or That's or, called torture. Or you could do what um, I found recently. It's called the Black Apple. The Black Apple. Explain, Alex, before we go to break. Black Apple is when you take... So you have your glass. You're right? mixing. No, this is not a beer. Then you're mixing. It is a beer. Okay. It's a way of consuming beer, though. So you take you, you take your nice glass, right? And then you put in some Angry Orchard. And then you top it off with Guinness. And the Guinness stays on top. Angry Orchard stays on the bottom. So when you drink it, it's like... Oh, dessert. Oh, apples in there. Black apple. Oh, gosh. You can also do it with any other cider. I actually have one uh, at the house. It's a pear cider from California. So it's a black pear. California. I don't remember where that's from. I still don't know what show that was. If you ever want to look up the Eddie Belfort save from the 95 playoffs against Detroit, that glove save, there is a video on YouTube that just has like this, this 90s TV show right before and then it cuts to it. Save by Belfort. I'm like, I don't know how it happened welcome to the keel show <laughs> Homes of tangents and tangerines. we're over here we're over here listen if we had a whiteboard back here alex there'd be zigzagging lines it looked like a massively messed up christmas tree it would look like the scene from uh it's always sunny in philadelphia where uh um, what's his name yes <laughs> that guy he <laughs> why that... tell you how phase three works we'll do that later after we talk to pete weber of the nashville predators Next, here on the Kuehl Show. Sorry, I didn't mean to take that from you, but I just, you know. It's fair. It's fair. Just I, I, I didn't mean to. It's fine. We'll be back here on 12 Out Sports. Oh, should I not be talking right now? Esports are here to stay. Go to jazzsports.ag, log into your account, and look for our new eSports section on the top of your screen. Browse through all the different available matches and watch them live with our exclusive eSports betting platform. Get instant access to game results, pending and graded bet reports, outright bet types, and upcoming match schedules, all at the easy reach of your fingertips. Jazz Sports puts you in the game. Drink Aid, ready for distribution worldwide.
All right, welcome back to the Keel Show here on 12 Ounce Sports. Once again, we have to give a sh- huge shout out to Luke DeCock for taking the time out of his vacation to talk to us. But we are going to stay in the southeast southeast region. Jeez, you need some more Red Bull in the air, Alex. <laughs> yeah, I know. But we're going to be talking <laughs> about Nashville hockey, the Nashville Predators to be exact. Since day one, we're going to be talking to the radio voice of the Nashville Predators, ladies and gentlemen, Pete Weber hey, on the show today. Woo. How are we doing today, Pete? Do I walk through a curtain like we used to on the Tonight Show? <laughs> no, because we don't have a band, unfortunately. We're working oh, on okay. that. Unfortunately, my office right. does not have room for a band. If we did, it would be just like some like a drummer or a trumpeter in the corner. Actually, the wife may have a trumpet at home. We could get her to do that, right? I don't think that we, should be good. What do you think, do Pete? this virtually. Oh, I, 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 see, I agree. She's in the other room. She's we'll, playing it loud. We'll set up the cameras, get a green screen going. It'll be perfectly fine. Oh, man. In that case, Beautiful. we're going to be live on... ESPN before you know it, back when back when NHL goes back to ESPN. ESPN but, the Ocho. Oh, yes. We're going to be live. It's going to be great. But, Pete, we obviously brought you on here to talk about the current Nashville Predators. But before we yes. get into the current Predators, as someone who's been around the organization for 22 years, how great has it been for you to see this team go from a team that was considered to be not a hockey market team, it shouldn't be in Nashville, to what is now known as Smashville, one of the biggest hockey markets now in the NHL. It's been a lot of fun. And interestingly enough, they tried the Smashville moniker in the first two or three years of the franchise. It just didn't seem to stick. And then they came back to this after the transfer of ownership uh, over the course of the 2007-2008 season. And uh, it really has caught on big time. And I, I like how you referred to the former, let's call it the Toronto approach, that hockey did not belong in Middle Tennessee to what it is now, where I think the groups of people that enjoy coming in here more than any other are those representing the Canadian markets. Yeah, and I mean, you, you really hit the nail on the button there. And you're just talking about you know how much this team has grown and uh, talking about the popularity of it. I was talking to... Uh, my aunt the other day, just how, you know, when they were visiting down in Nashville, they would want, they went to a Nashville versus the Detroit Red Wings game. And a lot of the fans and you know, a lot of the seats were just filled with red because a lot of people moved down there for work, you know, with the Ford plant and they just wanted to watch Red Wings hockey. But now you, you try to get in there and it's, it's not a cheap ticket at all. And it, it's really no. a, an environment that you want to be in. It's very hectic, very loud. And I mean, not even just inside the building, especially outside when, you know, you're talking three years ago, this team was in the Stanley cup finals and just having that in complete atmosphere, having country bands just playing on rooftops, it's become an entire event for every game. Well, the uh, the whole thing when the Stanley Cup final was here in June of 2017, that was also the time for the annual CMA Music Fest. So that really turned downtown Nashville and around the arena. It turned it into almost a hockey version of Woodstock. <laughs> it was unbelievable walking, and I'm up from the Woodstock generation, so um, maybe you guys can't relate to that as well as I can. But well, let me uh, call my grandpa up. I'll ask him. There you <laughs> call your grandfather up, and uh, boy, uh, we're coming up on what the 41st anniversary of Woodstock, and we've uh, very close as well to what immediately preceded that, and that was landing a man on the moon and bringing him back. Yeah, yeah, and you know, talk, I mean, talking about that amazing atmosphere that there was just only three years ago and you know now the team kind of falling back to i would say would be would be a fringe playoff contender with trying to add pieces and taking them away and trying to maneuver the different players around to try to have a good run at the stanley cup again what has made this year's team different from teams that you've seen in the past well for the first time ever in team history a mid-season coaching change and uh peter peter laviolette uh one of what to select three who have taken three different teams of the cup final replaced by John Hines. And now of course the rumors are that Peter Lavalette might indeed end up replacing John Hines in New Jersey. Uh, whether that comes to fruition or not, though remains to be seen. Uh, very, shall we say uneven season. And since John Hines took over and boy, he had a lot of chance to implement his systems, right? He shows up for his news conference as announced as the new coach and coaches a game that night. But after starting out 500 through the first 14 games under Coach Hines, they uh, now have uh, gone 9-4-1 and 
since. And uh, going into that pause, they were 6-3 and three and beginning to play much better defensively. I, I think the numbers earlier in the year were almost like an unfair indictment of Pecorino's play, but now they're finally protecting the goaltender. What, what do you think there, Pete, makes it such a big difference? Because obviously, Lavi, like you said, a great coach, has a pedigree, a history, mm-hmm. Stanley Cup champion. What, what, was the, what made it the right time to get rid of him? I mean, like you said, it was the first time in the history of the franchise they ever had a midseason coaching change. And what made it a good decision to bring in John Hines, who, let's be honest, did not have the best go of it in New Jersey? What made that transition from Stanley Cup winning coach to a coach that was recently fired by New Jersey? How did that actually begin to work? for the National Predators? Well, number one, recommendations played a huge part in John Hines coming here because former Preds were involved in the recommendations, and those were ex-assistant general manager Ray Shero uh, at New Jersey and his assistant, the original captain of the Predators, Tom Fitzgerald. Both highly recommended John. They were with him previously as well uh, with the Pittsburgh Penguins organization. Now, when is the right time? I believe this is only the second time in David Poyle's tenure as an NHL general manager that he has made, a, maybe the third, a mid-season coaching change. So that tells you that he is Mr. Patience. What really precipitated that? I don't know if I have any direct idea as to what it was, but I think David was witnessing what he thought was a club that they had you know, great expectations, if you want to go back to old English uh, novels, and uh, we're not realizing them. And so they go to play the Winter Classic in Dallas, had a 2 nothing lead on the Stars, end up losing that game 4-2, then have a disappointing swing through Southern California, losing uh, against the Anaheim Ducks, and uh, that in overtime. And by the time the team got back home, I believe the decision had been made, and it was made just prior to hosting the Boston Bruins. Yeah. I remember that game to that Winter Classic. Because first of all, it was odd it was in the Cotton Bowl. But I guess, you know, Pete, from your perspective, as a broadcaster, calling a game in the historic Cotton Bowl in a football stadium in a state that, you know, 30 years ago, people didn't really think could be a hockey market. Now Dallas is. How exciting was yes. that for you as a broadcaster to be broadcasting two teams that, like I said, 1990, really didn't think they were going to be good hockey markets? No. And of course, in 1990, the Stars were still in Minneapolis, St. Paul, playing Bloomington at the Metropolitan Sports. And the Predators were merely somebody's dream. Uh, That was special. And it was more than special for me. I'm a Notre Dame alum. And when I was a freshman, Notre Dame decided to go back to playing bowl games. And guess where it was? At the Cotton Bowl in Dallas uh, against the uh, Texas Longhorns. They played their consecutive seasons, actually. So for me, Walking in there, it was really going back in time. And then to see that crowd and how they were, uh, that was a spectacular, spectacular event. And for me, it was even better because international TV pushed me out of my intended broadcast location way upstairs in the press box, probably closer to Fort Worth than Dallas. (laughs) And they put me down on the glass inside the blue line. I had a monitor to see the other end of the ice. I have never had a better vantage point uh, to do a hockey game, whether college or pro. Now, that definitely does sound like probably the best seat in the house, getting a whole monitor and everything, getting that close. I would I would have loved to have been at that game. He was almost like calling a you know, WWE match. He's right there at ringside. That's what he was doing. I mean, <laughs> I mean you're yeah, not it was kind of like that. I was just looking for some of my favorite wrestling buddies, and I didn't see Moose Cholak or anybody like that around there. Well, you're in Texas. I mean, that's, you know, the Von Eric country there. I mean, we're going back to the yes, 70s, of course. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, someone, I mean, the Freebirds probably come out. Michael P.S. Hayes would be singing. And, <laughs> oh, gosh, that would that would have been bad news. That would have been bad, bad Street USA news right there. Oh, boy. See what I did there? The only bad thing about that game, about the presentation, was they had four women on horses holding up the various state flags representing the two sides. And the Star Spangled Banner, and then they set off the fireworks, the rockets, red glare. And boy, did I feel sorry for those horsewomen who somehow or another (laughs) were able to maintain control of their steeds because I was thinking there was going to be one huge galloping away out of control. Oh, my goodness. All of a sudden, we have the Dallas Derby. (laughs) There you go. I'm talking about runaway steeds here, getting back to the, the, 
the task at hand. I, I'm just talking, trying to put this team back together here. What has been Pecker Rene's kryptonite this past season, especially when, whenever you're hearing about a coach being fired and a coaching change that can kind of mess with the psychological, you know, temperament of the entire team, especially a goaltender who, and let's be honest here, everyone knows goalies as being that weird guy that sits in the corner and does everything to a T. I am totally sane, and you know this. Ah, <laughs> uh, sure, okay. But what would you say has been the thing that's really brought Pekka Rene's game down um, as, you know, just this season, possibly the past couple seasons? Well, I'm just going to talk about this season for that because I think it's been D-zone coverage. Uh, the team, as the year started, was going strictly – with man-to-man coverage in the D zone and getting scrambled about crazily and setting up many high opportunity shots for the opposition. John Hines changed that coming into coming into playing a zone. And I think that has made all the difference in the world in the, in the course of the last uh, 15 games or so. And I, I really feel that was the cause and then the effect of what was uh, the problem for the team earlier in the year. I, you know, it's funny because, well, Alex and I, I've particularly done play by play for teams that do run a man coverage in the D zone. And in hockey, it just doesn't work out quite like that. I mean, it can maybe work in basketball where it's a lot more stationary, but hockey, because there's so many moving parts, you run into your teammate, you yeah. run into another player. It's difficult to run that. And a zone just seems more simple, uh, more simple, simpler. Well, particularly in today's game, the way the game is played today, I think it does. Right, and that's why I think is I'm thinking as a goaltender's perspective because the saying goes sometimes that if you ever see a coach fire, look at the goaltender's numbers. And like you said, Pecorino's numbers haven't been the best, but like you said, it was the chances the Predators were giving up. And Ooh. I mean, yeah, yeah, they've just it, it, when you, you can't when a goaltender's facing you know grade A chances all the time, eventually his numbers are going to go down. I'd like to say I am a I am a victim of that, but I just gonna, I'm just going to put this one up to poor goaltending, Alex. But I <laughs> I I think you know. Do you think that's going to – how much has that helped that team? Just the def- change of the defensive mindset because that comes with a coaching change. And John Hines, like you said, brought in a different style, and now the Predators are back to being a winning hockey club again. Right, and it also helped because in that game at the Cotton Bowl, Brian Ellis was injured. They hit put on him by Corey Ferry yep. and did not return for a long time thereafter. So that also, Brian Ellis's return, I think, has played a role in the team tightening things up defensively. And, of course, now the Predators are going into the play-in round against the Arizona Coyotes and just kind of sticking with this trend, Alex, of non-hockey market teams. At least, you know, 20-some-odd <laughs> years ago, Arizona, a team that's a lot better than a lot of people are giving credit to. They're going to be healthy. They're starting goaltender Darcy Kemper coming back. What is it going to be for this Predators team to really get going in order to, you know, try to get through Arizona to move on in the playoffs? Well, this play-in round <clears throat> and the whole, the, as far as that goes, the round robin for the clubs who know they're going ahead in the playoffs, the top four finishers on each side will be playing their uh, round robin. Predators have not played Arizona since two days before Christmas. So I don't know if I can give you that I have a really strong handle on what they're going to do. I can tell you that, you know, and I think this is the case against everybody, Oliver ekman Larson is usually the best player on the ice when these two teams meet. But other guys have really began or begun to assert themselves. Lawson Krause played pretty well in the second meeting of these two teams. Nick Schmaltz, I think, has come on tremendously. Same with Clayton Keller. So how do the Predators counter all that? We hope it's their T-zone coverage tightening things up. And that Philip Forsberg, Matt Duchesne, Ryan Johansson and Victor Arvidsson come back to the four offensively. Yeah, this it's definitely going to be a tough one to get past, and it's going to be really interesting to see how that play-in matchup goes on to, or goes into the new playoff format. Now, let's go to a couple of fan questions that we have here at Minor League Rando uh, is uh-huh. is uh, talking. This is actually one of the people that we have on 12 ounce sports. Nice talking uh, with Rando talking minors with Rando, Who, by the way, the Rando just put on our comment section saying the Yotes are overhyped and he spelled overhyped with, uh, looks like four R's, four or five <laughs> R's there, but that's a lot of overhyping. Yeah. I guess so. Geez. I, I, I didn't think I talked about that much, Alex. I mean, yeah, man, <laughs> that is true. So he asks, what does the future look like for the predators after the bubble playoffs end? 
Well, if they end unsuccessfully, they have a chance of getting <laughs> Lafreniere, who the first overall pick of the draft. That placeholder win uh, was intriguing to me. I don't know if that's overly fair. I think that the bottom seven teams should be the only ones that really had an opportunity to draft number one. But I think the Predators will just move forward. That has been the David Boyle tradition. And I think that's the way that he would approach this. Unless they go in there and just get ripped. Let's, let's say they, they lose three straight. And, you know, like by margins, you'd see with the old days when uh, the Soviets in the World Hockey Championships would uh, take on some cl- club like Japan and rip through them 10 nothing or something. So, oh, gosh, hope that, it's not that bad. <laughs> right, exactly. But, I mean, I think it would be something, uh, the equivalent of that, uh, that bad a beating that would precipitate any sort of change. I guess and that, that's going to be interesting because, I mean, Alex, Lexi Lafreniere playing with Philip Forsberg, I mean, that would just be a line in itself. But like I said, it should be the bottom seven. But if I, I mean, we'll, I mean, uh, Pete, we don't want to have you here for three more hours because we can go into that for a while. But another question. Well, that, there's no question, including with my friends in Edmonton, right? Oh, man, I'm sure the, I'm sure Edmonton really does not like the, uh, the draft lottery at all. But one of the other questions the rando asked, he asked what, was your favorite catfish to be thrown on the ice? So I guess what he's asking is, what was the <laughs> biggest moment when you saw a catfish thrown on the ice? Was it the first time? Was it sometimes during a playoff run? When when was Pete Weber's favorite catfish moment? The one that caused me the most humor to come out was just after they had put the mesh up above the glass at both ends of the ice. And one of our fans here at home didn't realize it was in. No. Goes up oh, and boy. throws this, I'm going to say, 12 to 15-pound catfish <laughs> to go over the glass, only to have it land splat on a couple oh. sitting right behind the net. Uh, that <laughs> that was something that you, know, you couldn't help but laugh, slapstick to be certain. But then the other, at Detroit, and the fans coming up to Joe Lewis Arena, one guy is one of those nights where the Red Wings just had their way with the Predators, and there's a guy all of a sudden I see in the start of the third period in a yellow rain slicker walking down to the area behind the penalty boxes at Joe Lewis Arena, and he didn't care by that point. I think the Preds were down 5 or 6 nothing, something along those lines. He just threw the fish over the penalty boxes onto the ice and turned around and said to the security guys, all right, take me out of here. I've seen enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just walking home in defeat. I, I, I love funny. those fans that are just like, ah, oh, we're going to lose this game. Sabotage. Yeah. Throw- <laughs> I, I I guess you're really throwing in the proverbial towel. Towel fish. Is a, the fish. Is a, yeah. yeah. The, the cat throw, towel, maybe? Throwing in the fish. Whenever the Predator is apparently going to lose a game, you throw in the fish. Po- quite possibly. Uh, so next question we have here for you. Eamon Smith asks, who or... I, I would just say, who is your favorite homegrown predator? So someone who the Nashville Predators uh, got, you know, brought up through the uh, development system, drafted. Who right. would be the best predator that, I mean, or at least your favorite one that you've seen come up through the system? I think because all of us like underdog stories, I'm going to go with Patrick Hornquist, the last player in the entire 2005 draft. And he comes on and is able to accomplish What he did, I mean, the first player in that draft was Sidney Crosby. After the trade from here for James Neal, Sidney Crosby and Patrick Hornquist ended up as line mates every now and then. And I think Patrick has outscored everybody drafted uh, in that 05 draft after the first round. Uh, That's not bad for a guy who was, as the NFL would put it, Mr. Irrelevant. He's got 238 goals to his name. In uh, those years, he has played in the NHL. He, I remember, and it just, it just, did it hurt a little bit that he was the one that scored the goal then in 2017? Oh, yeah. There's no question that it did. And uh, that was, you know, boy, that was June 11th. I had never done a game with the Predators, with the Kings, or with the Sabres that moved on into June. So uh, when you consider my first year in the NHL was with the Kings in 1978, I waited a heck of a long time to get to the Stanley Cup final. But I could appreciate the effort of Patrick Hornquist. He was, was, I think, the Predators equivalent to Thomas Holmstrom, who we always called the Swedish Redwood 
The only difference between their two games, Holmstrom for the Red Wings and Hornquist for the Predators, was that Holmstrom backed into the goaltender. Hey, now, Patrick hey, now. Goes no <laughs> knows first all the time. Well, that's true. Yeah, they both ran into the goaltender. That's all that mattered. At some point mm-hmm. or another. Holmstrom had, uh, compared to maybe Peter Forsberg, the largest backside of any Swedish hockey player I've ever seen. And that includes Borea Salmi, who was a beast. And I mean, yeah. I guess, I mean. There was to... another from my early years, Juha Vidi. Oh, man. Whitey Whitey. He, he had a, shall we say, a prominent posterior as well. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are at the Kula Show, judging the the uh, butt hawks, as Forrest Gump would say, of Swedish hockey players. <laughs> but, I mean, you talk about those Red Wings, and I remember because I mean we were born in Michigan, so we saw a lot of Red Wings fa- games, and I was a fan growing up as well. And then eventually, I, according to my dad, turned to the dark side and became a Leafs fan. I, you know, those games yeah. in the I would say around the time the Predators first made the playoffs in '04. It always yep. seemed like, because that was back when they played each other eight times a year in the Central Division. Those games mm-hmm. were just, you may as well have just thrown a ring around there, get you know Mike Ellis there in the ring and get Bob Buford because there were fights every night. There was literally the fight oh, yeah. night down in Nashville when they had those mustard sweaters. I mean, th- that used to be the matchup in the Central Division back in the early 2000s. I'll never forget the night. It was the night we called it the Harmonic Convergence when the Predators beat the Red Wings 8 nothing. And uh, in the course of that game, Steve Eiserman took a misconduct and got so angry when he slammed the penalty box door shut, it broke the glass there. And I thought that perfectly captured the whole spirit of that evening. Oh, gosh. I remember that now. Oh, my. Mild manner Steve Eiserman, who I've met in person, and is just this nicely calm guy. He only every so often got a little bit on edge. And when he did, watch out. Five foot ten. I mean, he's going to come after you. But I mean, yes, he he is. And I mean, man, that's, I mean, of course it's great to see, obviously, because back then that was like, oh, the wings will beat the Preds. And like, oh, this Nashville team's pretty good now. They got David Leguan and Thomas Focoon who caught with the wrong hand. But I mean, it's good to see now that Nashville has become a, I guess, a, a market that players want to go to and compared to, you know, their first few years in the league where everyone's like, ah, it's another expansion team. I mean, that's a great thing to see there, Pete. Well, the, the first years, virtually every trip, the Predators took on the road was some sort of special promotion night so they could sell the tickets. I remember in St. Louis, it was Pepsi label night and you would get a deal like two tickets for $12 with the two Pepsi labels to work in there. That was the sort of thing they had to do to sell uh, to the road bands. The Predators came in there, but this whole Red Wing thing, uh, we held a conversion night uh, one night. I think it was year three. Any Red Wing paraphernalia, the pennants, T-shirts, caps, bring it to, it was not Bridgestone Arena yet, but bring it to the rank at 501 Broadway, and you will get an equivalent Predators item. Hmm. We ended up filling up four refrigerator-sized boxes of Red Wing stuff, and we were going to take on the Wings the next week in Detroit, and we put those on the plane, and I took them to the Boys and Girls Club of Detroit, Hmm. and those kids were happy as happy could be. Uh, and uh, it seemed like that was the time when it really began to turn from that hybrid Red Wing fan to Predators fans. That, that's an awesome story. I never knew that. Oh. That, that, that makes a oh it makes it brings a tear to my. That's that's <laughs> actually a really sweet story. I I never heard that. Like usually I hear those dumb stories all the time. I never heard that because I mean then again you don't hear you know teams you know helping out other teams stuff like that. I mean that's just something you don't see in the game. But I guess that's the way. I mean. I mean, good on you guys. Well, I made a call to an old baseball friend, Willie Horton. Oh, sort of yeah. Helped us along with that thing. So that was good. That'll do it. Willie Horton, man. There is a name that I'm pretty sure if my dad's looking at it, he's like, I remember him. Well, I mean, my dad dad is old. He's turning 50 this year. <laughs> but <laughs> relatively. Well, I have quite a few years on your father. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you've been. Let's put it this way. When Willie Horton made the throw to nail Lou Brock at the plate in game five of the 68 World Series. I was already a senior in high school. Man, now that is a memory, sir. And I mean, obviously, you've been doing this for quite a while, so you probably have a lot of memories in sports and uh, 22 years of you know calling Predators games. That's just Nashville, let alone before that as well. That is true. But we will let you get back to enjoying your evening. Once again, we have been talking to Pete Weber, the longtime voice 
of the Nashville Predators. You can follow Pete on Twitter at Pete Weber Sports. Pete, thank you so much for spending your evening, or at least a little bit, talking to us Yahoo's up here. I keep, <laughs> I keep calling us Yahoo's every time we do that, but you know what? Well, I think I, I might mean, stick is, with it. Is there a better way to describe us? <laughs> Guys, you are very welcome. And uh, get your dad a six pack of Strohs for me, okay? Absolutely, we'll absolutely. He's going to come up in the comments now and saying he really likes this guy now. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you later, Pete. Okay, guys, thank you. And once again, that was Pete Weber, the voice of the National Predators. Man, I I love talking to broadcasters because where coaches and players, and I this is not against any talking to any coaches and players. I've just had interviews that have been kind of you know very monotone, very you know very vanilla. Broadcasters, I mean. I don't want to say, I mean, we had with Ken Cal last week and Jack Michaels, they, they, they love to talk. And of course, even Luke DeCock, I mean, the guys that follow the teams, they like broadcasting. They like talking about the game. They all talking, just talking. I remember I, t- I tell everyone the story about how I met Ken Cal that he had no business talking to some random scrawny senior in high school kid who was about the same height as he was by that time. And I just said, like, he sat there and talked to me about five minutes. And he told me if I ever wanted to go to Ferris, I should talk to Jeff Blashill, who at the time was coach of the Griffins. And I was like, yeah, Kent, we're, we're talking. Are we having a, cause at that point I'd never really talked to anyone like that. I mean, I'd met, I met Ted Lindsay. I met Steve Eiserman, but I never had a Hello, conference. Hello, sir. Oh, I was like, hi. Oh, she, John, John Van Beesbrook was another one though. Of course he had been long since done playing. And I remember I met him and I was like, well, yeah, that was when he was the general he, manager of no, the, no, he, no, no, that he was, wasn't GM yet. This was before he became the head of, um, U S development, U S hockey development. That's right. It was right before I met him. And apparently his, uh, his son went to Cornerstone, Cornerstone university, right down the road from us. Hmm. Back when Davenport were rivals with Cornerstone. Actually, no, no, they weren't. What is, what league is Cornerstone in? I have no idea. You're more into the college Davenport sports than I am. Here, here, well, here's the thing. I mean, Davenport's a completely new. We're Division Two school, sir. Oh boy. Oh, jeez, Dad. Oh man, Dad's texting me because remember how we were talking about beer before the break? He said, "Dirty bastard is a Scotch ale. Guinness is light as Miller Lite." Oh, whatever. All right, Dad. We don't have a talk. Uh, can we talk? Can we do that? He said, that's awesome. I don't think, I don't, can we have a conversation, like wait for him to t- chat? I mean, I, I don't think our listeners would enjoy that. No, but what they probably me. would enjoy is a little break from us talking. So we will take it to commercial here. Obviously, talking to Pete Weber was a phenomenal thing. Never would have guessed. Wait, wait, what? Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Never, never would have guessed. We will talk about some other stuff. Phase three, phase four, St. Louis shutting down. Huh? All that and more next on The Q Show. Esports are here to stay. Go to jazzsports.ag, log into your account, and look for our new esports section on the top of your screen. Browse through all the different available matches and watch them live with our exclusive esports betting platform. Get instant access to game results, pending and graded bet reports, outright bet types, and upcoming match schedules, all at the easy reach of your fingertips. Jazz Sports puts you in the game. Drink Aid, ready for distribution worldwide.
And we are back here on the Keel Show. Your host, Alex Keel, alongside me, the Inside Insiders, Tyler Keel. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty. We had a nice conversation with people talking about the Canes. The Canes? Really nice people talking about the Preds. But. Well, hold on. We got to talk about the Preds a little bit. We got our boy Mike Carvelis talking here in the chat here to the, well, to the, uh, the left, no, the right of the show, the left on our screen. He's talking in the comments here on YouTube. You Mike go. said it first, which is one of our other shows we have on 12 Ounce Sports. Host of that comes up on Friday nights, late night. For all of you Western Westerners out there, Mike said it first. He's asking, he's a new Predators fan, Alex, and as a hockey fan, why should he be excited about Nashville? And I'm sorry we couldn't get to that, uh, Mike, when we talked about with Pete Weber. Obviously, we were in the middle of conversation, but obviously, catfish. Catfish is a great reason to get into being a hockey fan in Nashville. Why? Because Catfish A is good. Nashville hot chicken's not like listen, you can go to a game on Broadway. Says the person says, I will never eat Nashville hot chicken I've unless heard, I eat it in Nashville first. And I'm saying that it, they love it. They love it down there. There's a reason why. Go to oh, yes, dinner. Go to a go to a five o'clock dinner. Obviously get there early because Broadway can just get packed. Not right now, obviously. Four o'clock dinner. Four o'clock dinner? Get out there early, have dinner for a while, have a few drinks, and bam, just walk down. You literally just walk down from Broadway to the arena, to Bridgestone Arena. Get down there, watch a game, go crazy. Yell, you suck at the goaltender. Count how many goals. Pretty much copycat Michigan, but I will digress. It's a, it's a great environment, I'd say. And and you know what? I think that's one thing that new fans of, I mean, possibly a different team, or even just new fans of hockey in general, that's one thing that they look at. I mean, for me, that a big reason of why I root for the Hurricanes, I mean, other than the fact that I just like them i think they're cool you picked them as your dark horse once and you jumped on that bandwagon so hard they had to change the suspension tyler you jumped on the least bandwagon when they were awful when Jonas gustafson was their starter alex those were some dark times oh not oh what was it oh seven and one to start that season not a good time to be a least fan alex but i did it well it hasn't been a good time to be a least fan for how many years now 53 yeah over five decades of sucking you're welcome yeah no Going back to my point is rooting for any team. One thing that you have to think of as a fan, whether you're, you know, at your home watching it or especially in the arena is the atmosphere, the types of, you know, I I guess, you know, the different environment aspects of it. I mean, if you're a fan of Columbus, one thing that you'll probably say is they got a cannon. They got a cannon. Nobody else has a cannon. Well, excuse me, college football, every, like almost every team in the South has a cannon. National Hockey League teams. Nobody else has a cannon. Why didn't they have fire the cannon off during the Dallas game? I'm just saying. The Cotton Bowl. It's a cannon. Because uh, nobody, they're not. I'm just not saying, Columbus. okay, we not are. Columbus. How many years not until Columbus. Columbus finally gets their game? Columbus. At the Horseshoe. Oh, God. Columbus. Well, I hope it's got to be Pittsburgh. Columbus well, and Pittsburgh. Well, I know Pittsburgh getting another game would be annoying, but it's got to be Columbus and Pittsburgh based on the divisional rivalry. Here's the thing. Can I opt Here's the to thing. not have it in Columbus? Can we have it in Cleveland? No, absolutely not. But I don't like the Buckeyes. Because I don't want to watch Lake Erie burn in the background. It's or have they cleaned? Fine. Clean? fine. They, they probably cleaned it a lot. Okay, they may have. But no. Go but ahead. it's got to be in Columbus. At- I know it's the horseshoe. I know it's bad, but you have to do it in Columbus. It's the different, you know. It's like having Chicago be a home team at Notre Dame. It just, pff, who cares? Chicago fans, even though you guys are original six team and you've you know been around for a long time, once again, the only city that claps during the national anthem. I personally don't like it, but it's your thing. And that's all you. They, Mo- more power to you. They start cheering. They have, and I always love, because I forget the guy that sings the national anthem for the Hawks. He is an Indiana grad, University of Indiana, or Indiana University grad. Goes and always sings, take me back home to Indiana. During the Indy 500. While the Purdue marching band plays. It is just the absolute worst thing they ever could do every time. But they do it every year. Not this year, obviously. but Right. Because that's Alex. That's a rivalry. Purdue and Indiana. They don't like each other. Right. But it's... It just, it, woo, it's just, Indiana. It's not just... No, wait. It's more like Indiana, which is more of like a, rec, uh, a vertical re- a rectangle. Okay. If we're talking about shapes, you got to use your imagination. Imagination. SpongeBob, SpongeBob reference. Alex, here. we need but, graphics so I can do the rainbow. Woo! You're the graphics guy. I don't know how to do a rainbow on this thing. This is our second week. We didn't even start with mics, Alex. How does that make you feel? Let's get back to hockey. How Let's about that? Let's get back 
to hockey. So, doop, doop. I did mention it before we went to commercial. The St. Louis Blues have more or less shut stuff down. Multiple members of the organization testing positive for COVID-19, which goes along with a nice little number that was released by the National Hockey League at 11 a.m. on Twitter by NHL Public Relations at PR underscore NHL. They made this statement. As of Monday, July 6th, the NHL has had 396 players report to club and club training slash practice facilities for optional participation in Phase 2 activities. There have been in excess of 2,900 COVID-19 tests administered, including more than 1,400 this past week to this group of players. Those tests have resulted in a total of 23 returning confirmed positive test results for COVID-19. In addition, since June 8th, the opening of Phase 2, the league is aware of 12 additional players who have tested positive for COVID-19 outside of the Phase 2 protocol. All players who have tested positive have been self-isolated and are following CDC and Health Canada protocols. The NHL will continue to provide regular updates on the number of tests administered to players and the results of those tests. The league will not be providing information on the identity of the players or clubs. And scene. So what pretty much he went with is that there are nine more positive cases. Allow me to give you guys the cliff notes. Or Spark Notes, whatever they use nowadays. Spark they, notes. they still use Spark Notes? Spark Notes. I've been out of school for a minute. That's it's why. Spark Notes. Spark Notes, okay. Spark Notes. Spark Notes. Not Garrett Spark Notes. Those would be bad and probably back down to the minors. <laughs> Hold it together. Hold it together, Alex. Get the mic away. Almost making me spit the drink out. <laughs> uh, making tr- watch the laptop. <laughs> oh, poor Alex. Oh, but- my God. You're- <laughs> <laughs> Garrett Spark. Savage. Great jokes. I Listen. We talked about it a little bit last week. The NHL is going to keep moving forward with this. And this is why it's a good way to tie into the phase three and four protocols. Cause it has to do with COVID cases. And we did mention off the top that the initial report was that Tuesday, the players had to, re- to tell their teams and the league for that matter, whether or not they were going to participate in the playoffs. The ones that are actually obviously in it, including round Robin teams play in series. Doesn't matter. Everyone has to say they're in or they're out. Now, obviously, that deadline has not been a firm deadline. Chris Johnson reported that it could be moved back because it has to be voted on by the Player Association and whatnot. But there are some certain cases with the COVID, obviously, awareness and everything, how everything's going to go. The amount of tests that they're going to do, Alex, daily has skyrocketed. Everyone thought, oh, it's going to be a few players. It's going to be you know, a select group, almost like, and it's going to sound weird, like a collegiate drug test. They give 10 random people, bring them in once every morning, whatever, have a few out of the entire university. This is going to be massive. Not just players, not just coaches, not just the one social media content coordinator that Chris Johnson reported that the NHL teams could bring to the Hub City, which, by the way, anyone anyone want to bring me up to Toronto? I can work. I'm an American. I can work for any American team. I kind of know how to do social media. Graphics are not my strong suit, but I can try. I've done social media marketing for two years. I've done it for one season. And I'm better I'll, looking. I'll go to Edmonton. Yeah, better looking. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, we're, hey, we're clearly competing for jobs here, Alex. I'm going to win this one. The, if, no, if I go, if, I'll say this, in front if, of the camera, Ty. If, if I go to Edmonton without the wife, though, and I go to the Edmonton Mall without her, guess what, Alex? Me a long rest of my life because she still holds it over my head that I didn't get Eric Carlson's autograph. Yeah, because here, well, here's the thing, though. I was working. I don't have that problem. So. Oh, well, you're luck- lucky you. Anyways, not just all those guys, not the social media coordinator, all that stuff. We're talking Everybody. hotel workers, hotel cooks, hotel chefs, arena workers. They get it, Ty. Everybody's going to be tested. Everybody. Wait, it's not imagination. Everybody. What? I'm pointing again. Alex and Pat told me not to point when I was a kid. You shouldn't point. I shouldn't point. What the? <laughs> As I point at you. <laughs> Anyways, there's a lot of points that the NHL made. And this was come around with the CBA talks because this was agreed on phase three and four protocols, both by the league and the players, the league and the players association, excuse me, Alex, if you could, please pardon. Oh, I was about to say, go down with some of the, um, some of the pointers of these protocols for phase three and four. Sure. So players, like you said, they have until Tuesday evening to inform their clubs of if they will play or not play in the Possibly playoffs. Possibly Tuesday, uh, which would be tomorrow night, by the way, tomorrow at five o'clock Eastern time was with the initial report. And 
Chris Johnson stated that it could be moved as a result of these protocols, having to be voted on by the return to play committee. Coaches are not being required to wear face masks on the bench, which I think is ridiculous. Well, okay. Because I, I, also, I, I, understand, also, I understand. Because also, too, they already said that referees do not have to play wear any sort of like face masks or not having like the guard thing either. And I say this, Alex, and I agree with what I can know. I know. I can know. I know the reason why you're going to say they should. But here's the thing. Those players, they're all going to be around each other. They're all going to be isolated together. Hold on. They're all going to be isolated together. Yes, they're going to be talking, but everyone's going to be talking. Alex, you have seen how nasty a hockey bench gets. Here's the thing, though. Hold on. I'm not done yet. Okay, fine. Let me go. All right. I'll let you go for it. When you're on a bench, and I get it, it's an uh, it's an empty arena, so there'd be easy to hear. But if you're on the other end of the bench, you hear a coach. Guess what? Seeing the lip reading actually is important because if you're far enough away, Alex, you've talked to people in masks. We both have. We both have been out in public with people wearing masks. It's tough sometimes, even if you're from me to you. If I can't quite see your mouth moving, I don't know what you're saying. So if you're on the bench and obviously your coach trying to get to your player, say, hey, do this instead, you don't know that sometimes because you can't see if he's talking to you. That's the thing. That's why it's important that it's okay. And like I said, these guys are all going to be isolated together. They're all going to be putting this bubble together, Alex. My point is, is that you go back to the guidelines and stuff that the NHL has to think about is the six foot rule, six foot social distancing rule that applies to standing six feet apart, breathing and regular conversation. So that's how me and you are talking right now. Not very passionate, just, just talking and not getting overly, you know, vocal about it. You're not yelling. What? Now you take that into consideration with players yelling on the ice, refs yelling on the ice, get, get the puck out of there, get out of the corner. And of course, you're corner. not even considering, you know, perspiration, sweating. Uh, well, that perspiration, that has nothing to do with COVID. It's, it's, Regardless. Re- it's respiratory, but I, I continue. And then also coaches where they are barking orders. That is going to project all of the, let's call them, COVID boogers or something like that. I don't know. Co- what? I don't know. Something. Water droplets. COVID All right. Droplets, hashtag that kind of stuff. COVID, COVID boogers. <laughs> hashtag COVID boogers. All that stuff. That It's going to make it go farther. So guys barking orders to his bench mate or to the players and guy skates by on the other team. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> are you seriously putting hashtag <laughs> COVID boogers? I'm making okay, it a thing. Fine. Hey, we'll make it part of the show. We'll just do hashtag COVID boogers like uh, Eliza Schlesinger does during your comedy shows. But I'm just saying, you should try to make it as easy as possible to contain this kind of stuff. Even if it's an inconvenience. Like you said, it's not that bad to you know be able to listen to somebody when there's no fans. There's no in-arena music. Or they may have in arena, in arena music between the... Of course, you put it on there. Hashtag COVID boogers. Make it a thing, Alex. They may have in arena music during the, you know, inter, you know in between play, that kind of stuff. But other than that, really, are you going to be doing that much else? Is there any other noise that you really have to compete with? It's an empty arena. I, but play is going on. Everyone's in. Hey, man up. Hey, watch it. You know, coming on. Man on. Move it. You left, should be doing up the wing, up the boards, off the glass. Though, is you should be doing everything in your power to make sure that nothing bad happens. You, it's better to over prepare and have nothing happen and be slightly inconvenienced by it than playing the cards just a little bit too tight. I, I like I said, I get what you're saying. Playing a little bit too close to the chest, if you will. But they're gonna and they're but that's the thing, Alex. Literally, the, the fact that Alex said this thing. is actually happening is a risk in itself. We talked about it last week. We talked about how the league is going to have to move forward with this no matter what. And that's why the following protocols that continue on, which Alex is going to say here in a second, are involved in how they will react if something were to come about while these playoffs are going on. But, so, let's continue on. So the next thing on the list is reaction to illnesses. Teams are not permitted to share any information on if a player tests positive or not for an illness. So whoever did the Austin Matthews deal, you suck. HIPAA is a thing. HIPAA is real. You clearly just decided, I'm going to be famous. And not in a good way, Alex. Infamous is the proper term. 
Under the CBA, the sicknesses are to be treated as hockey injuries. This ensures that players con- contracted or players that have contracted the illness while a member of the team are not contracting it from elsewhere. That's how that was worded. I'm sorry. I just no, no, I, I know. I, I, I get pretty it. much. They said they got it. Well, it was, a, it's a workplace injury is if I guess for our, you know, everyday folks, I mean, that's a, it's a workplace injury instead of like getting hurt out, you know, when you're out in the parking lot and saying, Oh no, I got hurt at work. No, you got hurt while you're off the clock. No, these players will be treated as hockey injuries if they contract the illness. Right. So the next thing on the agenda is penalties for hub violations. So individuals leaving without permission may be subject to consequences up to and including removal, a.k.a. if you decide that, oh, maybe you want to go to a club in town or whatever, you may not be able to play the rest of the playoffs. And by the way, the stuff, the reaction analysts and penalties for hub violation, all from Elliot Friedman, good buddy for each, texted me all this yesterday. Oh. No, I actually read his article. This time he didn't text me. He's been busy, okay? He hasn't been... Listen, we haven't talked in a minute, That's so. enough of that. You're stupid. <laughs> so, this can... Inc- in addition, violations will result in, for clubs, significant penalties, potentially including fines and or loss of draft choices. Which could mean, Alex, the first overall pick. If it, somebody from, let's just say, Chicago, if Patrick Kane and no, John no, the Taste... I'm going to talk to Pete, you know, Pete Weber. Nashville, if they, you know, get eliminated. If, if Ryan, well, no, if Ryan, no, it's, if, once they get eliminated, it's fine. But if Ryan Ellis, before game two decides, ah, let's go out to this place over here, and they get swept by Arizona, guess what happens? You ain't feeding the puck to Lafren, your buddy. Or at least there's not the one eight. Cha- I don't know why I did that. I don't why know. Did why did I go I full scale? I don't Southern just, you just yeah. stop right there. The South, this dude, the Southern whole hockey thing we've been doing today, it's just, it's getting to me. I mean, I have, you know, some nice chicken soup, but I feel I like. I know we, I played some do we Florida KFC. We go to get some more KFC, don't we? I'd rather go to Popeye's at this time of day. Ooh, Popeye's. That being I say, we need a Waffle House up here. No, we don't. Yes, we do. We have this thing called... Mike, if you're still watching, Waffle House. Should it be in Michigan? Yay or nay? Actually, no, no, not just Mike. Everybody. Hashtag Waffle House in Michigan. Make it happen. I'm not going to put that on the screen, though. We already got COVID. However, in regards to the public penalties of hub violations... Per Frank Saravelli, players can leave if authorized, but will be subject to a quarantine upon return. Families will be allowed to join teams that make it to the conference and Stanley Cup finals. Tyler, your thoughts? Mike got us the hashtag COVID boogers. He's making it a thing. Retweet. I, I'm okay Thanks, with this. Mike. <laughs> Good on you, buddy. As, and even Rando says Waffle House. Get it up here. Okay, um, we have New Beginnings Breakfast. That That's basically our Waffle House. Yes, but it's... Listen, Alex, We where we used to live on Four Mile and Plainfield, there is a Walgreens on one side of Four Mile. On the other side is a CVS Pharmacy. Tyler, we We don't, can have a New Beginnings against the Waffle House and have them compete. We don't need two places where the convicts are cooking. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone is. That's the joke, though. What is a new beginning? The Rando. It is a restaurant that's pretty much a northern Waffle House. Basically, but it's not as good, and they don't have good grits. No, they don't. Then again, nobody in the north has good grits unless you make them for yourself. How are you doing? Hey, Dad, how about your how about your grits, Dad? He's keto. He don't make grits. Oh, no, that's right. I still have them in my cupboard. But I'm okay with the NHL doing this quarantine because, you listen, some emergency happens, family emergency. You can't be forced in and stay somewhere. Like if you were at work, Alex. And you say something happened to somebody of your family. Guess what? You're darting. Now, yes, if this were the case in the NHL, you have to, hey, uh, Mr. Bettman, or would it be daily? Somebody at the NHL office, I need to go. Because of this reason, they get approval, they can go. And for safety purposes, they get quarantined after this, which I'm okay with, Alex, because you don't know where they're going. You don't know where they're going to be traveling to. Well, where they have... you, you would know where they're well, going. Because but you don't know who they'll be approved. Correct. But you don't know who they'll be interacting with. I guess that, well, I mean, excuse me. They, they don't will know that because that they're going to have to request that be like, Hey, my wife is going into labor. I'm going to be going to see my wife, possibly her family, but you <sighs> crazy things happen. Okay. I know. Listen, they're going to want it to a T the detail to a T. I get that Alex, but you know, what's going to happen. Something may, some, you just, do it, I know what's going to happen? I don't know. Something may happen where they may contract it. So that's why they're doing the safe, the safe move by having the quarantine that I'm okay with. So that's so. an extra two weeks that you can't play. I don't know what they didn't exactly specify That's the what length. Quarantine means they well no they didn't say the fourteen days they just said they they may be subject to a quarantine whether it be four days a week they don't know if they have to leave Canada it's two weeks 
Well, yes, can I, yes, in Canada, you're right. That's okay. Good point. Because I, I, hey. I, I said good point. Take it and leave it. <laughs> but the rest of these, I'm okay with because I like the fact that the NHL is knocking down and saying, "All right, you want to leave? Good. <laughs> See you later, bud." First round draft pick gone. Second round draft pick gone because you were gone for three days. Whatever. Without permission. Without permission. It's like you know when you're in class and you you know you roam the halls for too long. You know that's just you, you go you go down to the principal's office and you say what you're doing. You may lie just to make sure you didn't get any more punishment. But hey, see Tyler, not everybody was you. I only saw Mark Thomas like three times. Sure, buddy. Only three times. One of them was actually on accident. Regardless. I like the way they're taking all this. So it's good to see that they're actually getting involved and a lot and making sure it's clear. Cause one of the big things we'll kind of get to here with the CBA is that you don't want to leave players in the dark of what they're doing. And the fact that they're making anything in the dark, they're making this public for everyone to know. So they can obviously that we can be in the know us in the media and players can know. Cause I'm sure there's some players, Alex, that don't quite talk to management that don't quite talk to, you know, captains all the time i didn't talk to my captains all the time and they knew everything and i just kind of sat off to the side played goalie and annoyed the heck out of everybody else but mm. regardless of the fact it's something that that's good now the players know hey here are the rules here's what's going to happen don't do this or you're in trouble and that's you know from a player's perspective that's you know kind of reassuring now we know that the players have to be quarantined they have to stay in the bubble or else and now they know that if these players are tested and all everything all the time, every day, hundreds of tests done every day in both hub cities, they'll know that they're in a safer environment. But the big thing, Alex, is this. We didn't mention this when we talked about the, um, in Edmonton, the conference finals and the finals, the hub cities, is the fact that families, once we get to conference finals times, both in Toronto and Edmonton, families will be able to join. Now, I don't know. You just said that. What I, did I say that? Yeah. Oh, we did say that. Yeah. Okay. We said that. We said that. Okay. It's not the first time, though, that either of us have not listened to each other, though. Shall we move on? No. Well, I'm just saying that's a good thing because <laughs> it allows them. Now, I, now, yes, the specified members of family or how many family members you can bring has not been specified. Now, granted, we have to start playing first in order to get to the conference finals, Alex. Right. So we won't know probably till you know, we get to act round two, probably, which may not be till the end of August. But regardless, we're getting close. Protocols are there. But now, money. Yes. Cash so- money. So, like we mentioned at towards the top of the show, the CBA talks between the Players Association and the league have come to a quite possible extension with the uh, outstanding confirmation of the players and the team owners. Tentative. For tentative. So it's I'm gonna look up the word possible for you, Alex. CBA. Tentative. tentative. I'll look it up. It's not, I'm going to look it up. Tentative. Not certain or fixed or provisional. Well, sure. Let's go with tentative. Tentative. Well, that is the word. That was what it said. On that's what everyone said. Okay, thanks. Well, no, a tentative agreement. Anyways, so these changes are obviously possible. You know, coming as a result of the return to play talk, and changes would go through the twenty twenty five twenty six season. Bon approval. Big talking point of this, and we've talked about it on the show, and I actually did a part of a, a part of a report on this is the escrow and how this is going to to affect the players with the pandemic. An estimated twenty to twenty five percent of players' contracts would be withheld um, with escrow in place, and as of right now, it is at a fourteen percent um, escrow level. So this fourteen percent of their player's contract is being withheld um, for agents. Now, I will say, no, not for agents, for the league. And, I will, and I will say this. Oh, eh, for the league. Well, agents and players have their own separate deals. Here's the big thing about escrow is that a lot of people don't quite realize. They think, oh, the league takes it, holds it from themselves. That's not necessarily true. The league does that to ensure that the league still continues to be profitable through economic hardships such as this. Now, obviously, this is a once-in-a-generation type of deal. I don't think, hopefully we don't have to experience for another century. The point, hopefully never again, but I digress. It's happened before. It'll happen again. Everything goes on and on. History repeats itself. But the big point in all this is the fact that the the league, if it makes enough money, will distribute it back to the players if there's enough. So when I'm, so pretty much what we're saying is, you know, it's like when you're paying a loan, but you get interest put on it. So you only pay, you actually end up paying more. So you give 14% to the league. You may only get 7% of what you give them back. So you may only get half of what you give them back. That's what I'm saying. So money does come back to the players. However, the players want more 
The players want more money. There, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And deservedly so. They're some of the best athletes in the world. They're fantastic. Yes, they make 20,000 times more than Alex and I do combined, but I digress. 20 times thousands less than Major League Baseball players, but continue. I'm just saying. Is that my thing or is that your thing? What? I'm just saying. That, is that an us thing? That's an us thing. I'll, I'll take credit of it. I, I'm glad that because Artemi Panarin is the one that really started all this. Panarin came out and said, listen, we're not going to put ourselves at risk unless there's proper escrow control with the new CBA. And that's really kickstarted this. One guy, a star player in this league who's making over $10 million, but still a big player in this league speaking out and saying, listen, we need to be treated better. Well, that's how it always works. You know, you're not going to listen to a fourth liner, as, as sad as that kind of sucks to say. I mean, it's it's one of those things. You're right. If Trevor Moore came out tomorrow and said, the, we need more money. Well, Trevor, you're making 700 grand. I mean, that's it's yeah. the top players that are always going to be listened to. Obviously, when you're talking about the Players Association right now, Patrick Kane's a top guy. Taves is a top guy that you're talking to. Crosby is a top, top guy that has a lot of push and a lot of pull in those kind of conversations. If you make a lot of money and you're very popular, if you say something, people will listen. So whether this is Artemi Panarin's original thoughts or it's you know him talking to other players and just be like, hey, we should probably get a lot of our money back. Just saying. And then obviously making a statement about how you know they should stay home and just not play until escrow situation is figured out. It, it's not like the league has a lot of time to figure this out. Right. But uh, per Elliot Friedman, um, the salary cap will remain flat for the next couple of seasons uh, with 20% escrow in 2021. So when I'm saying this, it's 2020-2021. So 21 or 2021 is going to be at 20% escrow with it dropping to 14 to 18% in 21-22. 10% the next season and six for the remaining years of the CBA extension to 25, 26. The salary cap, according to Frank Cervelli and many others as well, is that this, the, this of course coming from the national hockey league is that the salary cap will remain at 81 and a half million until revenue hockey related revenue returns to $4.8 billion, which is what the amount was projected for this season, which was actually, it was on its way to before the pandemic hit. So obviously it will go up just not for the foreseeable future. Right. That being said, a 10% salary deferral for next season, but can be repaid um, during the final three years of the CBA. Now, one thing that we need to note, though, is that there's also a $32 million uh, playoff fund, which is doubled from seasons in the past. This is in, due to increased, uh, you know, just more teams and the pandemic um, with $20 million in the playoff next season. League minimum will be 800 thousand dollars by the way yes and actually rookies like an, a top rookie individual a could make 850 grand as well as that could make that and that's i guess one of the minimums that frank cervelli also reported on and i guess the big part though for the next few seasons that everyone's gonna have to look at is salary deferral and this really hit hard when the salary cap was really initiated after the 0405 lockout a lot of players had to take pay cuts. A lot of teams had to obviously break it down to make sure they could get under the cap. But now this year, they're going to keep it at one and a half, but players are going to have to lose a little bit of their contracts. It's going to be a little bit tough for the next couple of years. However, here's a silver lining to this. Players will defer 10% of both salary and signing bonuses for next season. However, Alex, they will be paid back to the players in three equal installments in the 23-24, 24-25, and 25-26 season. So therefore, the final three seasons of the CBA extension. Do you want me to tell you again that I already said that? <laughs> you just start rambling on. You start reading stuff, and I don't even know. I do read stuff. Now I'm going to do I'm that I'm just again. installing it. Doing that again. Just instilling it in the listeners and viewers. Because, now folks, you can pause this, rewind it, all that good stuff, because we're going to go into the different modifications for contracts. All right? Yep. You ready? Yep. You ready? I am as ready as I'll ever be. Then again, I wrote this outline, so... Fair enough. So the interesting modifications for as far as contracts goes, no trade and no move clauses that were lifted travel with the player. Previously, the team acquiring the player had to agree. Players aged 35 and over can sign multi-year deals that are flat or ascending 
and there will be no cap hit if they retire before the deal is up. Previously, the cap hit stayed no matter what, which is a a big deal. And also, there's no backdiving contracts like Henrik Zetterberg's deal. They get paid a lot up front, but as they get older, they get paid less and less. None of that right now. No more even with 35-year-old players. Year by year. Variability. Variability. Six-year contracts that are front-loaded and are worth at least 7.5% of the cap cannot exceed 35% between the lowest and or the highest and lowest salary amounts rules for other contracts remain the same. I've heard players and teams will consider backloading new contracts because escrow is capped at a lower number and cash flow should improve for the clubs. This is what Elliot Friedman, that, that little tidbit there at the end, that was from Friedman. Yeah. That, Pretty much long story th- short. This, this is quoting basically. This is not, it's more or less making sure. Paraphrasing. Yes, paraphrasing what Friedman said. And that little bit there, it's really wordy. But it's making sure that players don't make like $15 million in a season, in one season. And I know I've always had that theory, Alex, that players should be paid on what they get year by year. Because then you could have like, you know, just say Dylan Larkin gets paid $20 million one year. Like the, the fran- I don't say the franchise tag. What's the tag they do in the NBA? Where they get paid like a hundred million one season. Yeah, so it basically um, basically how it works is they I what it's called, but they have a limit of it's one player per season that they give the quote unquote franchise tag to something it, like that. Yeah, it, it basically says it's a clause that they can put that's in everyone's contract that they can for one season pay you as the franchise player. So you know even if you're a guy that maybe hasn't made a lot of money, but your team's not doing so got so good. You're going to be the franchise player this year. You're making a buttload of money. Justin Ablicator, you're a superstar. Yeah. $90 million. No, not that. Never, big. never, never, never. Um, moving on, there are no changes to signing bonuses. Yep. Uh, there are no more conditional picks in trades uh, based on a player re-signing with the acquiring team. For example, the New Jersey Devils, current third rounder from Arizona in the Taylor Hall deal, upgrades if he re-signs with the Coyotes. Agents and NHLPA staff felt hurt if or felt it hurt players' value. I like that. I do as well because I don't... Oh my gosh, we agree on something. All right, cut the show. That's it. That's the highlight of the season. We have reached our peak. Goodbye, everybody. You know. I don't... I'd have to hit the end we, stream we, button first. Yes, <laughs> we, we agree on a lot more than you probably think, but this I do think that this is a good thing because then it puts a lot more pressure on the player to, you know, whether or not they want to actually re-sign there because that's... Let's be honest. When you're signing a deal for... You know, even just two years, three years, or God forbid, six years at a time, and you're you're dedicating yourself to one place. That is a huge life choice, especially yep. if you have a family, kids, all that good stuff. Why do you think there's always the joke of the conditional seventh, Alex? The, the conditional seventh. The conditional seventh round draft pick. It's people think it's a joke, but guess what? Johnny Bernier, that conditional seventh. He didn't resign with him. The Leafs didn't get it. It's okay. We got rid of Bernier. I'm okay with that. And last, Reimer was better. But not least, <laughs> Bernier was better for the team. Hi, well, that's it. <laughs> no. The no. last thing. I don't for care if Reimer CBA. plays for your Canes team. Reimer was a better goaltender. They, they needed a defense. Michael Costco was a horrible defenseman. And, and you know it. the last thing for the good old CBA talks. Breaking the sound system here. Was. The topic of the Olympics. If a the new, Olympics, as Alex said, if a new CBA is finalized and there is a financial agreement between the NHL and the International Olympic Committee, not the IIHF, players from the NHL could be eligible to play in the Olympics in 2022 and 2026. Correct. I forget what 2026 is. Uh, I lost. don't know. I'll look that up. But no, it's this is something that's been building for a long time. And obviously the South Korean games, that was a whole hoopla and a half with the National Hockey League. They lo- I believe they lost a lot of fans over that. And, you know, we were there at the time, Alex, right after the Olympics. We were there right after the fact. We were doing the Kuehl show. We were doing our little TKS, our little 15-minute blips. And we did our previews and stuff like that. Had a great time. Milan. Ooh. 2026 Winter Olympics is going to be held in Milan, Italy. I don't speak Italian, but I love pizza. 
<laughs> Get out. <laughs> Alex, that's a window. Get Jump through it. <laughs> Get out. Go through the window. The door's right there. No, that way. That way? I can't cross you? Yeah. That way. All right. That way. I'm not going to do I, that. I... I'm glad that there's at least an agreement with the players. The players in the league, that's step one, because that was the big thing hold off, because the NHL didn't want to deal with the IOC, but the players wanted to go. So it became more or less a triangular fight. The IOC, well, not a triangular fight, more or less just a right angle. No connecting line, because the IOC and the NHL players, they never really clashed because it wasn't their problem. The IOC distanced themselves from the NHL, and that led to the league clashing with the players. I didn't want to clap too hard, because I feel like i already done enough yelling and breaking people's eardrums today. True. But I decided that it was a – I didn't decide it, but the league decided that it's going to be better for the league to actually get more – by the way, I actually work for the league. I'm undercover. No hey, wonder what, you, Which one's more realistic, me buddies with Freege or me working for the league? You buddies with Freege. Why, because I bash Gary Bettman? Yes. Okay, well, I, I kind of – did I sort of redeem myself last week when I praised him for all of his work? For five seconds, you did. Hey, five seconds. Overall, though, nah, yeah. you're still batting zero. I am bat. No, I'm batting. I'm batting. Here's a name for you, Tigers fans. Don Kelly numbers here. Batting 210 with two doubles and one triple and three RBIs. Anyways, hockey, Olympics. I am. I'm glad to see that this is actually the players in the league are on the same side. Because I think the league realized the financial ramifications of not going to the Olympics. It's a real big deal. They go out there. A. TV, because NBC, which is the NHL's little deal for the time being. Now, obviously, we don't know at that point, because I believe that's when the deal ends. It's 2022, if I'm not mistaken, which would be a key point. If I know I, and everyone keeps you know projecting that or predicting that the league will leave NBC and go back to either ESPN or get a deal with Fox. Who knows? But what is it? 20, 2021. Ooh. Ooh. So a lot quicker than you think. Boy. Oh my! Oh my! George the guy! Oh my! I, I mean, it's going to be great that they're going to see now the fact that I mean that could just score a deal right there if the league commits to going to the Olympics with NBC. At least have a fallback if ESPN NBC work would so. have to give the NHL a lot of money. Well, it depends on how much ESPN is willing to give them. Because you think ESPN is going to make a run for it? Oh, they absolutely are. They they made a lot of runs with. They're trying to buy up as much property right now, and they're doing a heck of a good job at it. Hey, man, they have Korean baseball. They have cornhole champion. And actually, no, that's actually NBC. I'm sorry. Regardless, NHL and the Olympics, they're going to be moving forward, and the players love it. It's great for the league. It's great. It's pretty, I don't want to say free publicity, but for the non-casual sports fan, everyone watches the Olympics. Everyone somehow tunes it in. I'm like, oh, let's see what's going on in the Olympics. Bam, hockey. Holy cow. Who is this Sidney Crosby? I mean, I presume he'd still be on the team at that point. I don't know who would be on Team Canada. There's a lot of predictions going on right now, but. Let's just say, I don't know, who is this John Gibson? I assume John Gibson would be the American goaltender at that point still. Would you say that the, the sponsors are excited? Then the fans are excited? Eugene Melnick is not going to be anywhere near the Olympics. The fact that he has to vote on this CBA thing is just ridiculous. Regardless, because, I mean, just stop it. Stop it. Don't get me in trouble. Even though I've already put myself in enough trouble as it is. It's going to be great because the NHL is going to get publicity. The players are going to get an experience, sometimes a once-in-a-lifetime deal. And especially guys that were probably in their prime around 2018, maybe towards the end of 2022, but they may still get a chance to go to the Olympics in Beijing. It'll be a great experience. And I, I, you know, from what I, from what I've heard, I've heard mixed stories about Beijing in 2008, but from the athlete's perspective, they took care of them from what I've, from what I heard, the stories, I didn't hear any horror stories like they did in Rio. I mean, so if they do that for the Beijing games, 2022, I don't see why not. I mean, we just have to see what the state of the world is at that time. I mean, it's still two years away. And heck, by this time last year, Alex, we weren't talking about how, oh, my gosh, we're going to have a coronavirus in here. No, we were talking about, Mitch, you got to sign, man. Is that what I sounded like? Uh, maybe. Anyways, at that point, the world could be on fire, folks. I'm interested. I just, I would like to see what happens. Yep. So that wraps it up. For, well, we got well, time. We got about you, 20 minutes. You here. want? Do you want to spend 20 minutes? What are we going to talk about, Ty? Well, we can talk about the, uh, the rando This wants the ESPN slash Fox deal again from the 90s. We don't want the glow puck, rando. Okay. The first, glow puck can die. First well, of it all, did die, but it stay dead. If it's about the glow puck, NBC tried to bring that back, so I don't want to hear it. Okay, they tried it for the All-Star game, and guess what, Alex? Why haven't you seen it since? Because it was dumb. 
Do you, have, do you have any other questions on there? Well, not really. Mike Caravellas is talking about how how Stephen A. Smith said that players can't have blank for three months in the NBA, so they'll violate the bubble, at least in the NBA players. Let me tell you something. Well, actually, you'd probably do better one than I do. LeBron James. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Going out there. Disney World. And you, you got you got Giannis and the Kumbo getting in some some weird Is it Giannis? I, I always think it's I always want to say Giannis. It's Giannis. I'm just glad see if that's I'm glad that I'm glad the Raptors beat the Bucks. Blah, 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 Giannis and the Kumbo talking about this over seven foot, getting in this little cart, making a fool of himself. <laughs> All I'm saying is this Disney World, they need to make an attraction. Whole new part of you know how they did a Toy Story? Nah. NBA section of the park. They'll have a Stephen A. Smith. Oh, that, that's, that's about all I got. <laughs> you just make Stephen the really point. Mike, I'm about to say, he sounds a little higher than that. It's preposterous. That's you know, pre- preposterous. Preposterous. It's preposterous that they can't do the show. That they can't do the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't do the head shake. My mic almost flew flying off my head. Hold on. Yeah, Audio Technica, by the way. Pete Weber was using one of these. Well, excuse me. We have the BPHS1 Audio Technica. He has a BPHS2. That's the difference between us, Alex, and the NHL. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're not a tech whiz like me, all right? A you're, tech whiz. I am a technological wizard. No, you're a guy that is listening to hard, hard, hardware. Oh, I'm that just, looks like works. That that looks hey those those uh, those are some good ratings there. I'm gonna buy, hey I'll be honest with you Sennheiser this kind of headset three hundred fifty dollars. That's how much it costs for both of these combined. All I'm saying is you know what I'd love to see is a conversation between Stephen A. Smith and Skip Bayless. No. I don't think that everyone. No, I'm kidding. No no no. Stephen A. Smith and O Dog from TSN because you want to know what because Stephen A. Smith got super heated when. He was doing the UFC coverage, and he basically got you know bad mouth saying that he he just didn't know what he was talking about just because that's not his sport, it's not his thing. Right. I would love to see Stephen A. Smith go off on some hockey guy because I mean think about it, NHL, NBA, kind of close in coverage, five on five, that kind of stuff. Right. It, I'm sure Stephen A. Smith would get it. Either that or he would he would throw a complete hissy, and that'd be just funny to watch. Um, is there anything else we got on the YouTube? Well, College Hockey News tweeted about a few minutes ago how he said Princeton following suit with Harvard with some differences. Biana Golodraga, I'm going to assume. I know assuming does, but leave it alone. A CNN Global a Senior Global Affairs Analyst from Houston, Texas, says that Princeton announces undergrads will be able to return to campus for one semester during the 2021 school year. First years and juniors welcome back in the fall, sophomores and seniors in the winter slash spring. Most instructional remain online, pretty much meaning that in terms of collegiate hockey, Alex, the Ivy League is going to be a little funny because they're only allowing so many people back on campus, which may affect hockey. And as Harvard made a similar announcement earlier today, it's weird. It's really in the Northeast right now. A lot of this stuff's coming down. We talked. Well, with, we talked just, with Harrison last week. What they'll week. just have is a really compressed season, right? And that's when we talked. I mean, think about it. the MLL is having their entire season in a week. Well, they have like a tournament. No, no, like they're straight, like straight up playing regular Wait, season you, games. You said MLL or MLS? Because MLS is MLL. Okay, the lacrosse league. Just making major sure. Le- major league lacrosse. There's just constantly changing there. Alex, you have a whole different sport. Fair enough. But no, they're playing like regular season games and playoff series one week. Right. That's their entire season. Well, yeah, because I mean it's hard because those guys. Because I mean, think the, about it. The, let's be MLL, honest. Those MLL don't get paid is a whole also lot, based. You know, it's a more Eastern biased league just because that's how lacrosse. I think is. Denver's the furthest west. If it's still, I mean, uh, I think I don't know if Denver they, Tech, Denver Dallas. Yeah, those, there's only a few teams left in that league, but. Yeah, it's weird time right now, and we talked with Harrison last week. It's going to be a very conference-heavy schedule. He sent me Ferris State's projected schedule for next season. Yeah. He told me there's a good four or five games outside of the conference schedule that may get canned. Obviously, Michigan State may happen. Obviously, Michigan may happen just because you're in Michigan. You can stay there, but they're not going to probably go to Robert Morris. They, I mean, that's why I talked about how tough it's going to be for Long Island University, their first-year program. It's going to be tough for them to get games in because – not many teams are going to go outside the conference. They may only play 20 games next year just because you're going to have to try to p- pick and choose. Like, you'll be playing Bentley two times next season. Maybe playing Princeton. Maybe play Dartmouth a few times. I mean, hey, hey play Dartmouth, then you'll just get to poop on Dartmouth. 
Listen, if they lose again to another two-win team, I'm just saying. Of course, I'm going to poop on Dartmouth. Oh my goodness! Hey, that was a good. Hey, that was a good back and forth. I'm just like to say that I won that battle. It was not a good back and forth, and you. Lost. I won that. You battle. lost considerably. If you, wanna, if you want to see a just a pure comedy, like a Shakespearean comedy, good old Hamlet style. What? Hold on, Hamlet is not a comedy. Yes, Why? Because there's funny moments in The Lion King, which is literally just a cartoon animated version of stinking Stark and Hamlet. Tyler, it's a Shakespearean comedy. Hamlet is not a comedy. Look it up. Look up Hamlet. We have time. Look it up. Well, you go and find something to, to, from YouTube. From YouTube? So, yeah. Some, someone's got to talk about something here. Well, I think Dad turned off because after he was <laughs> talking about the puke eye state is his exact words. Oh, gosh. And by the way, he said puke eye state with triple U. Even though it's not how you spell puke eye, Dad. Oh, man. Do we have to have a talk with Dad about, you know, grammar? I mean, he has his own show, Quest, here on YouTube. K-U-E-H-L-K-U-E-S-T. Quest. All your outdoors equipment, advice, and all their great adventures. Follow them on Instagram and on YouTube here. They do live shows. Check out their stuff. Okay, Hamlet's a tragedy. Fine. Ha! Ah, Hamlet is a tragedy. Twelfth Night, Midsummer Night's Dream. Comedies. I can tell you the difference. Dad's here. Dad's here? What? Uh, Dad's here? What is going on? Our father is here. Uh, can you yell out to Kelly to let my dad in? Uh, No. Do, We're doing a show here. Um, unless you want to cut it. Because uh, at cu- this point, I'm sure anybody that's listening right now is just having a blast. Well, now we just are, chirped our dad because... What are these two idiots talking about? Our our father, who is if you're, if you're on YouTube, some, the Johnny BQL, that's our father. If you haven't noticed, he's apparently outside the door, and I'm having to tell Kelly to let him in. I mean, what do you mean I'm here? Well, I said he's at Dunham's. I'm gonna. I'm oh, oh, he's still. Oh, he meant he's here, like watching still. Oh, Dad, there's a comment section, Dad. Just just say something here. We can. Oh, I mean, we. I, good golly. But we started off with no mics. We probably should have left it that way. <laughs> We're ending the show with our dad. Okay, but here's the thing. This sounds yeah, really by it. the way. You're going to tell me about it? Well, we should probably should have ended the show a little bit ago, but that's fine. Well, you, we got to hold on until 830. We got because we got to still talk about what the Randall's going to talk about. We'll get to that in a minute. But you were saying, Alex. Well, if we want to talk about what the Randall's talking about, I mean, I, we, I can get into it a little bit because stuff. Stuff and things? Oh, minor league baseball. That's why. Well, I may as well mention Where's my Strohs? Dad, listen, we just talked to the, He's in Nashville. We can't drive. We can't. I mean, we can drive down there, but I just. I, I ain't driving down there. Your car, the far, won't, the, your car won't last. No, it'll last. It'll last. The yeah. farthest I'll go south is Sandusky, Ohio. Everywhere f- further south than that. You don't want to go there because it's your point. Exactly. As we, can't far as go I, there, we can't even go there now. That's as far as I need to go. And yes, you can. Is there a Waffle House in Sandusky, Ohio? Yes. There is? Yes. We're going to Sandusky. Hey, Kelly, we're going to Sandusky. Oh, my Lord. Think she heard me? Probably not. So let's talk about what, you know. The rando. Rando. Talking minors of the rando coming up next here at 830 here on 12 Ounce Sports. We won't take it away, too. Don't give him, Don't take it away, Alex. We're not going to take it away. We'll tell him what we're talking that's, about. That's though. his stuff, though. That's, that's his, his stuff. stuff. Whoa, whoa. We're backing off here. Anyways, are you raising the roof? <laughs> don't make me start dancing. I'll start dancing to nothing. So he's going to be talking about minor league baseball canceling their season, MLB schedule coming up, and a possible federal prospects hockey league rumor. Dun, dun, dun. By the way, and I'm sure Rando follows him as well, Bus League Hockey, an absolute great follow. Make sure to check them out on Twitter. I I, I know people think, oh my gosh, it's SPHL, it's Federal League. Listen, those are fun leagues to be a part of. Now, granted, yes, there are some. I was unfortunately the first year in Port Huron. Financially, the team was a little bit uneasy because someone forgot to pay their their emergency goaltender i'm not gonna say who but anyways they're fun they're they're good leagues good hockey i mean it's when we broadcast acha hockey that's a lot of guys go play in those leagues so definitely don't knock it until you see it it's fun minor league hockey just keep minor league hockey you get to watch hockey and there's gonna be some rumors about it some new teams maybe i'm just going for what i got from bus league hockey yeah no i honestly the thing i like about bus league is the fact that when it comes to smaller leagues, they give it as much coverage as they can because that's what they do. So, like, when I was doing my stuff, you know, way back. You With know, that one league that should never have even tried to exist but almost did anyways. That, anyways. That one league that tried to take the 
acronym for another league and try to make it its own thing, which is now the Michigan Independent Hockey League. Yeah, yeah. that thing that I'm not going to legally talk about on a show ever. <laughs> Can yeah, we, that whole well, thing. That's, that's not even a thing. What do you mean? Anyways. The, there's a whole thing about it. Talk to you after the show. But, no, they are a great source for, you know, my, I would say I wouldn't say minor league hockey, but you know even just smaller professional leagues like the SPHL, the FPHL, it it's just a good source. If you especially when you know these kind of times where you're just trying to find something to pay attention to, maybe looking at the Fed, maybe looking at the SP to look, just see what you're talking. They're about. looking to maybe expand. Dun, 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 dun. By the way. Which, by the way, yes, eight thirty, right after this show here, we'll take, we'll probably can't call it in a little early, just so we have some time for you guys to kind of breathe and kind of release yourself after getting all this content. Hashtag Cle- content. Cleanse your palate before you go to a better show. Cleanse. Wait, <laughs> this is not wine tasting, Alex. We don't drink wine on this show. Then again, we I don't think we can drink on this show. Probably not. Probably let's, not. Let's not. Do it's that. probably not a good idea. Even though I got some good stuff from Northern Latitudes Distillery. Try some of that after the show. Okay. Some good Deer Camp whiskey. Okay. Anywho, check out Talking Miners with the Rando right after this here on 12 Ounce Sports Network, 8.30 Eastern start time. I have to talk. The Rando says you have to talk. Why do I have to talk? I don't know. Why do you have to talk, Ty? I am talking. This is what I've been doing for the last two and a half hours. <laughs> Can we quickly mention, though, this Callaway hockey stick? Pardon? Callaway decided, remember how a few years ago, Alex, there was the CCM Ripcore? Wait, what? CCM Ripcord. They decided that they were going to do it. It was in partner with TaylorMade, powered by TaylorMade. It was a cool stick. Nazem Kadri <laughs> had it. Callaway decided, you know what? Apparently, we're not good enough. At, we're too good at golf. We're going to jump into another sport with sticks. Uh, Hockey. Shout- it's called, hold on, hold on. It is a limited edition Epic. The stick is called, I'm not kidding, Epic Flash 75 Flex Mid Curve Hockey Stick. So mid curve meaning middle of the curve. The all right, so light mat traditional grip has seventy five and eighty five flex, and has a couple you don't patterns. You need to get into the specs, Ty. All you need to get into. It, wait, can I order it? What? How much is it? Does it say how much is it? It is going for Canadian three hundred dollars, which is about two thirty. Still, Oofy. for two hundred dollars for a golf company creating a hockey stick. But golf, Tyler, that means to project the ball. It goes really far. Guess what? It's still not. A good hockey stick. Bus League Hockey retweeted the pictures from the Callaway website saying, uh, with the caption of, wow, they're finally making hockey sticks specially f- special for the Maple Leafs. They made the joke when Taylor made did the CCM stick. You're five years too late there, Bus League Hockey. I'm just saying. It's, it's funny, funny to watch me back when I do my slapping because it shaves my arms. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, because I have the Every video. Time. That's why I'm seeing the chat right now. I'm seeing, and we're about 10 seconds behind, so it's me just yelling at myself. And I could literally do this for an entire time. I'm saying, why am I staring at my laptop like a fool? I mean, it's because we do a podcast. That's what we really do. Well, I mean, we're just, we we're like trying to, to make we want it a, a face, show. And we just want a face because we want people to see us. Because like I said, Alex, people need to associate. Hey, because when they see us down the street, Alex, when we walk to the big cities and we walk in the events, I'm like, hey, those guys are from the Kula show. I mean, I then don't again, think we, that's happening. Well, us. yeah, because we have headsets on. I mean, you have a hat. If you wear a hat, they may be able to pick you up. My hair does not look exactly like this because the 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 headset makes it a little funny. That's why whenever I go to Ferris games, I make my hair all nice and pretty for the camera, or whatever. And then like five minutes in, it's just ruined because the headset. See, that's why you need to do the floof in the front. That way, when you put it, the floof covers the head part. Of no, it. then it just looks weird because it sticks up. I don't have enough hair to do that right now, Alex. Oh. It'll, it'll look like this. Does this look good? Can you see my receding hairline that I'm developing from my father, dad, and your you thing? Like that? Get better hair. Get better hair. <laughs> hey, dad, I need better hair. Want to change the oh, next there for us? What has this show come to? I'm just saying. We Hey, we have to late 30. This is what happens when we take, what what was it, like a normally a 90-minute show, okay? And then we stretch it to two and a half hours. Well, okay, how, how long were we going, Alex, before we went to this? I was doing like three-hour shows. Then again, well, then again, we had longer interviews then. But, I mean, we may do some longer interviews with certain guests on. We just got to make sure we plan around because I got to make sure that I can't have four people saying, oh, yeah, I can do one show. I'm like, crap, I can't fit you all at one show. Well, that's why you just need to do interviews. Oh, Dad's going to bring a beat down. <laughs> dad just texted me. Our dad just texted me. Said, beat yeah. down coming for the hairline joke. Well, so much for Christmas, boys and girls. See you all next year. No. I mean, hey, I didn't make any jokes, so I'm still. Oh uh, yeah, you're still. Yeah, you were sitting here. 
Lil Wally, thank you for the hashtag hair talk. Hashtag COVID boogers. Thank you, Mike, for that one. Hashtag hair talk. Hashtag, what was the other one I came up with? Uh, did, I, did I have another one? I had, I had another one between COVID that I didn't want to post because it just took a lot for me to actually quickly make a hashtag for it. I have no idea. I don't know. I, I mean, hey, I'm just excited to see all the different connection that we have because believe it or not, when we were just doing the podcast by ourselves and we were doing hashtag TKP, hashtag the Keel podcast, all of this good stuff, not too many people were, the obvious, there were a lot of listeners. Yes. Don't get me wrong. But not too many people getting involved in the conversation. Live show, boom. Now we have a lot of people. People talking aren't about saying it. us. Wait, hold on. Where am They're I? They're saying us. Hold on. I'm gonna make sure I'm, I'm, making, d- I'm making sure I'm pointing at the right side. Yeah, it's that way. It's this way? No, it's uh, that way. That way. Yeah, towards the comments there, over here. See this go. thing? Or if you're like watching Good on job. Twitter or Facebook down here. I'm sorry. If you're watching us tomorrow when we have the replay of today's show on YouTube on our the Kewl Show YouTube channel, it'll be down here as well, I would believe. It's preposterous. It's preposterous that you didn't watch us all live. <laughs> when you can also, Alex, if you don't want to watch us, if you don't want to see our beautiful faces, you can also listen to us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, iHeartRadio. I think we're still on TuneIn, but yes, you can still listen to us because that'll be Stitcher up. still? No, Stitcher was with a different company. Ah, that's right. Yes, but we don't talk about them anymore because, well, I don't know if we can't legally talk about them. It's just not right to. We're, we're not, not going to because exactly. we're with a better one. We don't talk about the IHL. 12 ounce Anyways, sports. 12 ounce sports. That's where we're at now. You did not just do a half dab on the show. I did. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, I got to do the outro. Hold on. No, wait. I can't do the outro by myself. Alex, I don't know what I'm doing. Get over here. No, hold on. Get over here and do the outro. I'm because I did it last week and I almost ruined it. I'm Actually, no, I did ruin outro. it. We can mess up the intro. We're not messing up the outro. We're not doing this. Why am I pointing at that specific spot on the table? I don't, I don't know. know why you're doing it. I'll do the outro for you. Thank you. Make sure to give this guy a follow at TJKU29 at the real Alex Keel for me. Next, we have Talking Miners with the Rando. The Rando will be talking about minor league baseball canceling the season, MLB schedule, and a possible federal prospects hockey league rumor. Make sure to give them a listen. Or should I just say he listens? Yeah. All about sports. Coming at you now. Again. And for the beautiful. Forever. Keep listening. Keep watching. All that good stuff.